Welcome to this tutorial about software-defined radio for time and frequency metrology, and we will do our best to illustrate. I am Jean-Michel Fried. My research activity is hosted by the Time and Frequency Department of the FEMTOST Institute in Besançon, France. My email address if you wish to reach me for more information and all references cited in this document are accessible on my website. Here is the outline of the presentation and the timestamps so that you can jump from one section to the other if you wish to skip some of the parts of the presentation. So let us start with what software-defined radio aims at being and what it actually is. The objective of software-defined radio is to try to remove as much as possible of the analog processing by feeding an analog to digital converter with a raw radio frequency signal and performing all uh, signal processing in the digital domain implemented as algorithm on uh, a processing system. This is in a strong contrast with the current analog implementation of most radio frequency signal processing chains, where an analog signal feeds a mixer to convert from radio frequency band centered on the carrier frequency transmitted by the emitter to base band defined as the frequency band centered on zero hertz. And because of the imperfection of this mixer, we might wish to insert an intermediate frequency so that uh, the um, imperfections are filtered out and a second mixing step will remove the intermediate frequency. So this two intermediate frequency step, um, uh, the super heterodyne architecture will end up feeding the uh, demodulation uh, hardware. In this case, for example, if we uh, discuss a frequency modulated signal, FM, where a phase locked loop acts as a frequency to voltage converter, then uh, we end up having the audio signal coming out of this PLL. The flexibility of this architecture is very weak because all parameters are fixed at a uh, hardware level with this intermediate because for one, the antenna here acts as a bandpass filter. The antenna will have a finite bandwidth uh, in which it will properly operate. Furthermore, A to D converter will exhibit uh, some performance limitation, most significantly a reduced number of bits, a resolution, uh, which decreases with the higher bandwidth. Uh, this number of uh, bits will define the dynamic range and will limit the weakest signal that can be detected if a strong signal is found uh, in between a uh, baseband centered on zero hertz and the radio frequency band that we are interested in in this uh, uh, analysis. So the practical implementation currently uh, uh, available of software defined radio is a mix where the antenna is connected to a first radio frequency front end that will transpose the radio frequency band to baseband. And once the signal has been shifted to baseband, it will be sampled using an analog to digital converter clocked at a sampling rate FS, so that the output of the signal it will be processed with software defined radio framework. This scheme here emphasizes two very different quantities, despite the both being named frequencies the local oscillator, the radio frequency local oscillator here will define the center frequency we are interested in. Basically, spectrum sharing between the various uh, radio frequency signals and matching the wavelength with the dimensions of the antenna that can be used on a given setup. This local oscillator frequency, radio frequency, uh, 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 frequency here, must not be confused with the bandwidth of the signal FS, uh, which is given by the sampling frequency of the A to D converter. We will see in this discussion uh, that the local oscillator will hardly matter throughout the discussion about software defined radio, because uh, the radio frequency band has been addressed with the radio frequency front end and has been removed early before even the same signal has been sampled. 
throughout the discussion, only the sampling frequency and the bandwidth will be of interest. So why are we shifting the paradigm from analog signal processing to software defined radio digital processing with its current implementation? David Mindel, professor at MIT, has extensively investigated the shift from analog to digital signal processing, especially uh, since the Second World War and the 1950s, starting with the Polaris missile uh, uh, IMU uh, that uh, led to uh, the Apollo uh, guidance system, as discussed in this reference here. And uh, the ar argument of David Mindel is that digital brings stability, flexibility, and reconfigurability. Stability means that an algorithm doesn't drift over time. If we implement a processing system using an algorithm running on a digital computer, the outcome will always be the same whenever uh, the time at which it is executed or whatever the environmental condition, as opposed, for example, to a capacitor whose uh, permittivity changes with temperature or with uh, moisture levels. Flexibility means that we can tune the operating conditions uh, as a function of uh, uh, environmental conditions, like uh, heating up uh, an OCXO will not maybe uh, be driven by the same parameters and a stable, stable uh, operating conditions once the oven temperature has been reached. And finally, reconfigurability is the ability to invest once in hardware and uh, many applications will uh, be uh, applicable using this unique hardware. Furthermore, uh, software-defined radio will provide some of the requirements of metrological systems, such as data logging, communication over network, user, inter user interfaces, uh, remote control. So throughout this discussion, we will apply software-defined radio to oscillator metrology, time transfer, and timing. Now, because I'm not so much interested in time transfer in itself than its use, we will illustrate some of the timing capability of SGR systems using radar systems. Indeed, radar signals aim at time stamping, uh, time delayed echoes of signals transmitted and uh, reflected by targets whose distance is given by the time of flight. So in the current architecture, we will focus in this scheme where a radio frequency front end transposes radio frequency signal to baseband and the signal is sampled at FS, the sampling frequency. To give you a hint as how rich this field is, uh, a selection of some of the references that I found in the literature discussing software defined radio usage in physics instrument, instrumentation. I have, of course, um, not addressed any of the radio frequency communication article, which is the basic uses of uh, SDR. So you will see here that some of the uh, hardware that we'll be discussing are used for uh, laser uh, frequency stabilization, for phase lock loop uh, feedback control, um, locking amplifiers. Um, we have some magnetic resonance imaging. Uh, this offer from NIST is discussing oscillator metrology using software defined radio uh, 2016. We've got some ultrasound uh, measurement. Uh, we've got some uh, uh, atomic and molecular optical physics uh, in investigation. So you will see that SDR brings you utmost flexibility. I do include some uh, radar communication because again, radar is closely related to time transfer. So uh, this offer from uh, JPL and the University of South Carolina, uh, Samuel Prager is discussing ultrawide and synthesis beyond the uh, limitation brought by the sampling rate of the A to D converter by using frequency stacking. And uh, we see at the end here some other investigation on the uh, on, uh, uh, radio frequency signal characterization. So you see that the field of software defined radio in physical measurements and physical instrumentation is broad and rich, uh, leading to multiple publications in various uh, uh, literature journals. Uh, in the field of communication and radio frequency communication, here is an excerpt of uh, JPL's uh, NASA uh, Deep Space uh, Communication uh, Publications, uh, this kind of uh, list of uh, publication addressing the use of software-defined radio in uh, space communication. And here the flexibility of SDR is emphasized in the case of uh, Mars exploration rovers uh, 
we recently had Perseverance landing on Mars and uh, 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 such uh, feet um, are eased by the uh, 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 link margins uh, benefits brought by software defined radio that can adapt to the uh, communication conditions. And here is another example where in 1997, when uh, Cassini reached Titan, uh, the moon of uh, Saturn, and it was about to launch uh, Huygens, uh, the probe landing on Titan, it was discovered that uh, the Doppler shift would exceed the bandwidth of uh, Cassini used as a relay. Uh, kind of a pity for a space agency to have forgotten uh, to address Doppler shift. And in this publication, we are told that uh, had the uh, radio communication system been a software-defined radio, the parameters could have been tuned remotely. Here, some uh, orbital parameters had to be changed to tune the uh, orbital uh, flight path of uh, Cassini and reach Titan so that Huygens would exhibit a low enough uh, Doppler while landing. So this emphasizes how uh, flexibility and reconfigurability of SDR will be beneficial to most applications. Now, this uh, benefit comes at a cost, and the cost is the challenge of addressing radio frequency front-end, uh, fast A to D converter, which will define the sampling uh, rate and hence the bandwidth, and such high bandwidth will necessarily mean some sort of preliminary processing using field programmable gate arrays. Only FPGA, which are fast and massively parallel, fast meaning multiple hundreds of mega samples per second being processed in parallel on multiple channels, will be able to address such data flow, usually using some rather basic uh, algorithm for preliminary filtering or decimation before communicating the data to a general purpose central processing unit. Now, this means that at least three layers, three levels of abstraction need to be addressed. The radio frequency front-end and the analog part where uh, amplifiers, mixers with the local oscillators and some filtering will feed the A2D converter. The A2D converter will sample the data at sampling rate FS and some preliminary processing will be performed by the FPGA. The central processing unit will be able to run much more complex uh, processing including communicating with the users, fetching uh, processing parameters, or data logging. Um, so this complexity uh, matching the uh, uh, radio frequency, uh, frequency front-end knowledge with uh, high uh, HDL, high-level synthesis, uh, description language, and general-purpose uh, languages such as C++ and Python is hardly accessible to a unique person. So, uh, quite a few uh, frameworks have been developed. Uh, Pi, uh, Purple has been uh, developed specifically for some uh, physics measurements. Uh, Shidal Spinal HDL will try to provide a framework uh, addressing both the FPGA and, and the communication with the CPU. Uh, and MyGen Litex will uh, give you some uh, ease, especially for optics. Uh, and laser stabilization experiments, uh, EDLIs also provide such frameworks. In the context of our work, uh, we have developed the OSCIM Digital, the Oscillator Instability Measurement Platform uh, digital framework uh, for addressing this uh, interface between FPGA, CPU, and preliminary processing in the FPGA. Uh, in the context of new radio, ATIS Research is providing uh, RFNOC. Uh, which is very centered towards Etus Research Hardware. Etus Research is a company in California uh, founded by Matt Etus and a massive supporter of GNU Radio. Uh, GR Verilog will give you some uh, interface between the HDL languages uh, running in the FPGA and GNU Radio itself. So these frameworks will ease the complexity of addressing all these layers. Uh, the FPGA to CPU communication might be either uh, external uh, through USB 3.0 through Gigabit Ethernet or could be internal for an AXI bus in the case of system of chips as provided nowadays uh, by multiple uh, suppliers including uh, Altera and uh, Xilinx uh, through their uh, system on chips or uh, Zinc CPU. Now, we will not get into the details in this presentation about these frameworks. I mentioned them so that you get started uh, in processing SDR signals. 
but we will be discussing in this uh, presentation GNU Radio. GNU Radio is a free open source signal processing framework with each digital signal processing block written in C++ or Python. Uh, the various uh, data processing blocks are connected to each other through a Python script defining the data stream, uh, could be C++ as well. Uh, and the main benefit of GNU Radio with respect to MATLAB or its free open source implementation, GNU Octave, or even Python with NumPy and SciPy uh, implementation, is that uh, GNU Radio will allow you for real-time processing of signals as opposed to Octave or Python post-processing. Furthermore, you will find it easier to uh, get started with New Radio thanks to its graphical user interface, New Radio Companion, that allows you to assemble blocks without even considering programming uh, 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 Python uh, scripts. So GNU Radio is, of course, uh, found on this uh, website, and we have recorded the basic tutorial on getting started with uh, GNU Radio. So let us uh, first start showing one basic example, uh, such as receiving broadcast FM station, just to illustrate how uh, GNU Radio looks like. So GNU Radio uh, Companion is a graphical user interface that uh, gives us access to these uh, uh, blocks. So in this case, for example, we start with a hardware interface. Uh, the Osmocom SDR is a low-cost uh, DVB-T receiver used as a general-purpose uh, software-defined radio. And we first tune the parameter, the center frequency of the local oscillator and the gain, as well as the sampling rate. The sampling rate of these dongles is anything between 1 MHz and 2.4 MHz. This is defined, driven by the hardware. We give a name to the uh, project, uh, which cannot be the default name, and we save a project uh, for uh, uh, being run further. Now, the first thing we might want to do to uh, analyze a new radio frequency signal is to display the spectrum. So we make a spectrum analyzer by connecting to the frequency sync. And what we see here is three uh, radio frequency channels uh, centered on 96.9, .9, the radio frequency channel that we're listening at. So we need to select one out of these three channels. So we select a, a low pass filter, no need for soldering irons, no need for characterizing capacitors. Uh, only thing is, we feed this sampling, uh, we feed this low pass filter at a sampling rate, sample rate, and we define the cutoff frequency and the transition width. The transition width will define the computational power needed to run this uh, band pass filter. So we can check that indeed this uh, band pass low pass filter acts as expected, and by comparing with the original signal, so we have a two input spectrum analyzer that will allow us to assess the efficiency of the low-pass filter. Indeed, the blue curve is now the low-pass filtered uh, input signal that has been uh, rejecting the other two uh, uh, FM uh, stations. Now, to uh, analyze this uh, FM station, we can decimate because we have much more samples than needed. The spectrum is broader than needed. And so what we can do now is decimate the uh, data stream and uh, use the wideband FM. We will see later how this is implemented to demodulate the FM stream. Now, uh, this FM uh, again needs to be uh, informed of the input uh, sampling rate, in this case, uh, one eighth of the input uh, stream. And we run uh, this demodulation scheme. Here we have the output of the FM demodulated spectrum signal. So we see here at 19 kilohertz uh, the stereo band, at 57 kilohertz we have uh, the radio data system, RDS, a BPSK modulated signal, but maybe we wish to listen to this audio signal. So we have a decimation by eight, we have another decimation by four, and you know that sound cards cannot play any kind of sampling rate. So we can tune the input sampling rate to be a multiple of the output sampling rate of 48 kilo sample per second. And in this case, we make 48 kilo sample per second times 32, 32 being uh, four times eight, the various decimation factors. So now we can include the audio sync and we define uh, the sampling rate of the audio card as being the sample rate divided by 32, by definition equal to 48 kilo sample per second. And because the block wants it to be an integer value, we cast the value as integer. And here is the output. Oh, well, see what you can find. If that is French, take a wrap for a meal. If that is sport, just see what you can find. Offering the FM station with its 
So what we wanted to illustrate here is how easy it is to get started uh, with uh, radio frequency signal processing. And you see that it only took us a few seconds to start uh, recording FM uh, broadcast station and uh, listening to our first uh, music uh, using software defined radio analysis. Now, let us try to do some more scientific investigation and let us discuss how to transfer time using software-defined radio frameworks. The initial hint on the requirement of uh, time transfer using uh, radio frequency systems comes from the radar range resolution equation, which gives you a hint of the requirement related to the bandwidth B here. The radar range resolution tells you that uh, the, the range resolution delta R is given by the timing capability of your radar system 1 over B inverse of the bandwidth of the signal and because a radar signal will be traveling two-way between uh, a transmitter and a receiver then this uh, two-way trip means that we get a distance which is one half of the uh, trip it took the time it took to reach the target. Now this is the the one half factor that you have over here, and we convert the time of flight uh, t with uh, a, a, a distance d uh, by uh, multiplying by the speed of light in vacuum c0. So you see here that the range resolution delta r is equal to uh, one half of the timing resolution multiplied by the speed of light. And this term here, the time resolution, will be given by 1 over the bandwidth uh, of the signal that is being transmitted. So the objective to improve the range resolution of a radar or to improve the timing capability of a radio frequency system will be to try to maximize the bandwidth over here, the bandwidth B that, uh, that we have in, in the uh, signal that is being transmitted. And uh, many means of uh, increasing B are available we can have a varying frequency, a chirp, that would be a, a frequency a swept a signal. Uh, we could have some steps in the frequency that would be an FSCW radar. We can actually spread uh, the spectrum by using a pseudo-random noise, as will be seen later. Uh, or we can actually generate a pulse, since the Fourier transform of the Dirac function is a constant function. So all these means have been applied for increasing the range resolution of radar systems and can be applicable to time transfer. So the question is, we are sending a signal with as broad a signal as possible, and we wish to detect uh, received uh, time delay copies of a transmitted signal. And this means we need to implement a match filter. Basically, this means that if we at the same time send a signal, let's take the pulse, which is the easiest to uh, intuitively uh, understand, and we have time delay copies of this pulse, we wish to find what are the time delays uh, between the transmitted signal and the various echoes that we have received. The match filter looking for time delay copies of a transmitted signal is called the cross-correlation. The cross-correlation will assume that the transmitted signal is known, it will be called over here y of t, and we will try to find copies time delayed by a time offset tau uh, of uh, y with respect to the received signal x of t. Now, if x and y are zero mean value random signals, then chances are that x will be sometimes positive, sometimes negative, y will be sometimes positive, sometimes negative, and the product of x and y will be a mean value of zero, sometimes positive, sometimes negative, and how to check the uh, energy accumulation of uh, matching of x and y, well, we integrate over the duration of the pulse, uh, t, and if this mean value is zero, it means that x and y do not uh, look similar. Now, if at some point the time delay copies of y are found in x, then whenever y is negative, x is negative. Whenever y is positive, x is positive, and energy will accumulate coherently. This means that this integral will no longer be null, but will become uh, positive. If x and y are phase opposite, it means that y is negative when x is positive, y is positive and x is negative, and your correlation 
might become a minus uh, negative peak, that would be an anti-correlation, meaning that the return signal is out of phase with the transmitted signal. So the objective of timing a system, a, a signal, will be trying to identify tau, the time delay. Tau, in this example, is the time of flight of the pulse that has reached the target, and identifying tau that maximizes the cross-correlation. On the other hand, this uh, signal X, noisy signal, uh, we wish to try to reject the noise, to try to find the transmitted pulse Y. So we would like to have a pulse to be as long as possible to try to smooth out noise. If you consider that when you have noise, the best way of averaging the noise is to have a sliding average. So we have a noisy signal and we wish to run uh, a sliding average so that we reject the noise and at the end we end up with a cleaned up copy of the signal that was transmitted. Well, the way of maximizing this uh, noise rejection capability will be to increase the duration T of this pulse. So we will see that we have a uh, duality between trying to maximize the duration T of the transmitted signal and on the other hand trying to maximize the time resolution, uh, the uh, uncertainty on tau, the time delay, and this uh, trade-off will be uh, defined as a pulse compression ratio as will be defined in, in a few slides later. So let us start first with spectrum spreading. What is spectrum spreading? Let us consider first a sine wave. A pure sine wave has no timing capability. All sine wave period look similar to each other and there is no timing capability. If we look at the spectrum of a sine wave, it's a Dirac function offset from zero by quantity equal to the frequency. If you wish to reproduce these charts, you will find the CNU octave or MATLAB script on uh, the corner of each of the charts. So a sine wave has no timing capability. The spectrum is a sharp Dirac function at a given frequency. Now, how could we try to introduce some sort of timing capability? We could flip the phase one out of two period. In this case, we're considering BPSK, binary phase shift king, where one out of two phases is shifted by 180 degree. It's better, we have a bit of timing capability, now we can differentiate one out of two uh, uh, periods, but yet uh, the timing capability is not very good. On the spectrum domain, we have now a spectrum which has become broader. We see that we have some additional discrete peaks centered on the initial frequency that is given by the carrier frequency, but yet the timing capability is uh, not excellent. How would we generalize this concept of that, uh, uh, differentiating one out of two periods for longer duration? We could try to introduce a pseudorandom sequence. A pseudorandom sequence is defined as a sequence that does not repeat more often than every n with n the number of bits of a sequence. Here, for example, we consider CA code the course average code uh, driving the GPS uh, space vehicle signals. And this uh, course average code is 1023 bit long, so that the code will not repeat uh, uh, more often than any uh, one out, uh, out of 1023 uh, periods of the transmitted signal. So you see here that this is a pseudorandom uh, VPSK modulation of a carrier. And if we look at the spectrum, we see that we have a continuous spectrum with a broader bandwidth. The further we go from top to bottom, the broader the signal, and the broader the bandwidth, the better the timing resolution. We will see later why this spectrum characteristics is related to timing capability. So the objective is to spread the spectrum to improve timing capability. A narrow spectrum has no timing capability. The broader the spectrum, uh, a spectrum of bandwidth B, will have timing capability 1 over B. Now, if we look this into the correlation, the correlation that we will be related to spectrum in the next slide, the autocorrelation of a signal defines its uh, uh, timing capability. Remember, what is the autocorrelation? If we have just said that the correlation is uh, the integral of, uh, so the correlation between X and Y is the integral uh, of the signal with the other signal time delay, the autocorrelation will try to find copies 
as a function of tau of the signal with itself. If the signal does not look similar to itself, then we will not have uh, additional peaks other than the time delay tau equals zero that will say the signal looks similar to itself with a zero time offset. So this is what we see here with the autocorrelation of a sine wave. The autocorrelation of a sine wave is a, is a flat curve. There is no timing capability in the autocorrelation. If we uh, flip one out of two periods of the BPSK modulated signal, we see that we have better timing capability, and yet the autocorrelation periodically repeats, meaning that we have some timing capability, but some poor uh, uh, identification of a time delay. And if we look at the spread spectrum, at uh, a duration was shorter than the 1023 bit long sequence, we see a unique correlation peak, meaning that the total random sequence only matches the uh, emitted pattern when there is a zero delay. The width of this peak is one pixel wide, one uh, bin wide, meaning that we have one ship duration resolution, which is the inverse of the bandwidth. So you see here that the broader the spectrum of the signal, the better its autocorrelation and the narrower uh, the, the, the timing capability. So where does this relationship between spectrum and uh, autocorrelation come from? Remember your convolution theorem. The convolution of a signal between a signal and a reference uh, as a function of tau is the integral of signal of t reference of tau minus t dt. So the convolution is related to its practical implementation for a Fourier transform. The convolution theorem tells you that the Fourier transform of a convolution of two signals is the product of the Fourier transform of the first signal with the Fourier transform of the second signal. And that makes the computation of convolution very efficient because we have access to a fast Fourier transform, which is an algorithm that takes a duration of n log n instead of n squared with n the number of samples in, n S S in S and R. Now, how does this convolution theorem relate to the uh, correlation? Well, you see here the expression of a correlation that tells you the correlation between uh, the signal and the reference of tau is again S of t multiplied, but this time instead of having a reference of tau minus t, we have t plus tau. This is a time shifted copy of reference signal. So we have a very close relationship between convolution and correlation, only this time we need to flip time. You see that tau minus t has become tau plus t, and how do you flip time? Well, if you look at the complex conjugate of a uh, 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 harmonic signal, exponential of j omega t complex conjugate is exponential of minus j omega t. So we conclude that the Fourier transform of a correlation between two signals is the product of the Fourier transform of one signal multiplied by the complex conjugate of the Fourier transform of the second signal. So despite not having access to a correlation in new radio, can we demonstrate this concept using the free open source framework new radio companion? So let us implement together uh, a correlation demonstration using new radio companion. We start by searching the noise source because we need to have access to a broadband signal. Now, we first wish to check that indeed the uh, uh, spectrum of this uh, source is flat, so we can have a look at the Fourier transform, as opposed to the previous case where we had a, an uh, audio sync that would uh, clock the signal. In this case, it's only a virtual simulation, and we need to tell new radio to slow down the data rate. This is achieved using the throttle block. Let's try to generate one uh, mega sample per second to make analysis easier. And what we will see here, if we name this as uh, a demonstration and we save the data in a, a, a writable directory, we can execute uh, the output of this uh, flow chart and indeed check by uh, middle click uh, medium averaging, check that the spectrum is flat. This noise source uh, will uh, use the whole spectrum available. So now that we've checked that the noise source is flat, we can try to create a delayed copy. Now what's important is that the noise source is broadband and it's a noise that is known. This is the most important aspect of this uh, 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 analysis is that we need to know what is the signal that has been transmitted. Now in order to assess uh, 
the uh, impact of the delay, we can try to put time domain sync, uh, and this time, so using an oscilloscope, we can just try to put the two outputs of uh, the two signals. And in order to tune manually the time delay, we can change the delay D here by using a Python variable. And this Python variable will be a, sl a slider uh, in the naming convention of NeuRadio is called a range. So we take a graphical interface range uh, whose name defines the Python variable name D. And we have a, a, a delay between zero and 100 uh, time steps. So if we run this example, uh, we see that, uh, first of all, there are two signals. Uh, they are complex, so we have i and q that will be defined a bit later. And if I time delay, of course, it's very difficult to observe what is the time delay between these two signals. So the match filter will aim at finding copies in the received signal of the time delay uh, emitted signal. So to do this, we will introduce uh, the Fourier transforms. So Fourier transforms are FFT, and the FFT, the fast Fourier transform, will need batches. We need to have batches of data, so we need to convert the stream into vectors, and the stream to vector will allow us to uh, perform the fast Fourier transform. Now, these vectors will be a given length. Instead of using a constant, we might as well, as often done in programming languages, use a variable, since this variable will be used at many places, so we can create a variable n that we define with length 1024, and we do the same on the second data stream with its uh, Fourier transform. So we demonstrate that we can actually uh, do the both Fourier transform, and having completed the Fourier transform, now we can uh, do the correlation. The correlation is a product of a complex conjugate, so we go for conjugate multiply to multiply the conjugate, and again, this will be operated on batches of data, so we need to inform that the vector length is equal to n, and once we've completed the multiplication, uh, uh, left arrow to rotate a block, we can uh, do the inverse Fourier transform so that we get the correlation. So inverse Fourier transform with, again, length n, since len is equal to 1024, that will not change much in our results. When we want to display, we have a time domain sync. Uh, we know how to observe, again, left arrow to rotate, uh, a real time, uh, a floating, a real floating point number uh, signal with length n to match the fat size of the Fourier transform. We need to convert vectors back into streams because this is what the uh, uh, time sync expects. So uh, length n uh, batch. And this will go from uh, the FFT to the uh, time sync. And the only thing we need to get is the magnitude of the uh, Fourier transform. So we convert the complex to magnitude. So here we have a complete uh, data flow to process the correlation. So again, we can run this. And if we auto scale on this chart over here, by moving the slider, we see that indeed we can detect finally the correlation peak. Now the correlation peak is on the extreme right instead of being at the center. So to change this issue, we actually have to change first uh, the direct Fourier transform are called reverse, and then we go this guy as a forward. Forward and reverse are just naming conventions, and by using this trick here, we can get center uh, middle button auto scale. Now we got the correlation peak in the center of the uh, of the correlation peak. So here you see that while previously looking at the time domain, we were unable to detect uh, what was the time delay. By now using the correlation, we have accumulation of the energy at the time delay uh, defined by this cute graphical user interface uh, range slider. So what we did here is we actually prepared a, a, another copy of this uh, flow chart in which uh, we create three copies of the original signal. So we have the noise source. The noise source is throttled to make sure that we uh, know what is the data rate. We have stream to vector to feed the four Fourier transforms, the reference signal, and the three time delay copies. And because the uh, correlation is a linear process, we can multiply, conjugate the reference with each one of these time delay copies and then take the inverse Fourier transform 
to analyze this uh, uh, correlation peaks. Now, this time, what we did here was that the time delays D are actually generated by function generators. This time delay D uh, actually comes from this probe, and this probe is actually gener generating this IDD. So we see here that the probe uh, is a, a method for uh, requesting the output of a generator, and in this case, the signal source will be a triangle, a square, or a sine wave. So we get three time delay decodes by sine, uh, triangle, or square, and we expect to get three copies of the emitted signal. And what you see here is that indeed we get three correlation peaks, one correlation peak shifting as a function, uh, as a time delay uh, looking like a sine wave, a second one looking like a triangular wave, and the third one looking at a square wave. So you see here that the linearity of a correlation allows you to detect multiple echoes with a time resolution given by inverse of the bandwidth. So this brings us to the extension of the basic chart where we have the follow the stream to vector through Fourier transform, multiply conjugate and inverse Fourier transform to the more complex uh, flow chart where we have multiple uh, Fourier transform and this is where you see why FPGA are so efficient because FPGA will be able to run in parallel unlike general purpose central processing unit, general purpose CPU where the processing will be uh, performed sequentially and uh, the FPGA will be able to run this FFT in parallel, multiply conjugate and inverse Fourier transform. Now this demonstrates basic uh, principle of time transfer using software defined radio and the general principle of soft of uh, signals of uh, spectrum spreading and now we introduce the uh, uh, pulse compression uh, ratio PCR uh, which states that the longer the code the better its noise cancellation capability what does this mean let us consider a sine wave and a sine wave to which we add some noise so this is the noisy signal that is transmitted and we wish to identify the time delay. So as we've seen earlier, uh, all periods of a sine wave look very similar. So indeed, we have a, a long uh, sequence of uh, signs with all sine periods looking similar so that when you autocorrelate this uh, signal, this is the blue curve over here, we have cleaned up the noise that was added thanks to the uh, integral uh, sliding over time duration t. However, the timing capability is very poor. We see that we have a rectangle, uh, uh, a triangle shape, which is the convolution of a rectangle. Why is it? Because if you consider that the sine wave is actually gated by a, a rectangular window, and this rectangular window is sliding as a function of tau, uh, the time delay, we have a first copy, which is the time delay shifted to the left. Then we have a time delay that matches here, uh, the overlap is only very small. Here the overlap is full. And if we had uh, a last copy of a, of a window that was shifted to the right, it would mean that we only had a, a tiny amount of overlap between the reference signal and the, and the time delayed signal. And uh, this triangular shape that we have here is actually the uh, shape of this overlap uh, of the rectangular window as the uh, measurement signal is sliding over the reference signal. So uh, how do we differentiate the first period from the last period? Well, we can try to generate a signal where the first and last period do not look similar. This is called a chirp. A chirp is a function, a sine wave, where the initial frequency is not the same as the final frequency. And if, again, I overlay some noise on top of this chirp, we have a noisy signal, but this time the, the correlation uh, chirp here uh, is the uh, black curve and we see that the width is given by the bandwidth and the bandwidth is given by 5 minus 1 equals 4 kilohertz. So instead of having a very narrow bandwidth uh, which is equal uh, in, to the duration of, of, uh, of, uh, of the sequence here, now we have a bandwidth that is given by the starting frequency minus the final frequency, and indeed the cancellation capability, the noise cancellation capability remains, but now the correlation peak has narrowed down to inverse of the bandwidth. And we can generalize this concept here to broader bandwidth. Uh, here the sine wave, a 3 kilohertz sine wave, will exhibit this triangular shape which is given again by this uh, overlap of a rectangular window driving the sine wave, uh, the gated sine wave. 
if we have a broader chirp, in this case 500 hertz uh, wide chirp from 3 to 3.45 kilohertz, you see the red curve here, the, the correlation peak becomes narrower. And if I put a 7 kilohertz chirp, I get uh, an inverse of 7 kilohertz wide chirp as the uh, autocorrelation. So again, you can use this uh, piece of software to try uh, this uh, numerical simulation by yourself. Now, the capability of, uh, uh, of the pulse, on the one hand, to create a narrow uh, correlation peak, and on the other hand, to uh, cancel noise thanks to its uh, averaging capability over duration t, is called the pulse compression ratio. The larger this quantity, unit less. This is a bandwidth inverse of second. This is a duration in seconds, so this is a unit less quantity. And the bigger this quantity, the better the uh, pulse design in a radar system because we combine the ability to uh, reject noise and on the other hand to have fine timing capability. So this concludes this part about time transfer. Now software defined radio uh, processing for time transfer, why are software defined radio systems uh, running uh, complex uh, number computation and not real numbers? Well, uh, uh, the, the Fourier transform of a real number is conjugate symmetric, meaning that the magnitude of your Fourier transform will be an even function. If I have a real signal, then uh, the positive part of the frequency here will uh, be the complex conjugate of the negative part, and if I take uh, the magnitude of the signal, I have an even function. Now, not all radio frequency signal will be uh, even, uh, the spectrum will be even, and when I take a, a radio frequency signal, and if I draw, draw it on purpose asymmetric, and I bring it to baseband, I wish to keep this asymmetric shape and not be forced to have an even function. How do I address this asymmetric shape? Only by having this spectrum being a complex quantity. In this case, the uh, positive frequency side and negative frequency side will not be the same. Now, another way of saying this is, imagine that I have a signal that is amplitude modulated. Now, this amplitude modulated signal is being transmitted, so we have a transmitter uh, that uh, takes an AM uh, modulated signal by shifting the amplitude to a local oscillator and uh, emitting this signal. And this signal is transmitted for a radio frequency wave to be received and transposed back to baseband by trying to match the local oscillator here and checking if I can get the information encoded on the amplitude. Now, this signal here is at omega RF and this signal uh, at the reception here will be mixed with a local oscillator so that I get something of a shape uh, propagation of a radio frequency signal multiplied by cosine of omega, the local oscillator, times t. So this is the mixing step. Uh, uh, Nonlinear processing is needed for uh, adding the arguments of the exponential because linear uh, system cannot uh, mix uh, frequencies. So this is necessarily a nonlinear uh, element, uh, either a diode or a saturated ferrite transformer. And from this output, I will get something that is dependent of, on proportional to cosine omega RF minus omega local oscillators time t plus the phase, and I get a second term, which is the sum of these two arguments. Now, the sum of the two arguments will be cancelled by low-pass filter, and I will not consider it. So this means that if we have a match between omega RF and omega LO, meaning that the receiver has been properly tuned to the emitter, this will be something of the shape cosine of phi. And now, this signal was amplitude modulated, so when I send the amplitude, I got the amplitude multiplying this trigonometric function here, and I get an amplitude cosine of phi. Now, this amplitude cosine of phi, uh, in case of phi equals zero, that will be fine because phi equals zero, cosine of phi equals one, and we get the amplitude. But what happens if phi equals pi over two? This will be always equal to zero, whatever uh, amplitude, if phi is pi over two. Because cosine of pi over two is zero. 
So this means that every time the phase shifts by pi over 2, we lose the amplitude information. How often does this happen? Well, imagine that you're listening at uh, FM broadcast signal, so around uh, 100 megahertz. If you're listening at a signal around 100 megahertz, this means that the lam wavelength lambda is uh, 300 over a frequency in megahertz, that's 3 meters. And this means that the half wavelength lambda over 2 is 1.5 meters. This means that every time I walk by 1.5 meters, I shift from a phase equal to pi over 2 to 3 pi over 2. So this means that along a path when I'm walking, listening at FM broadcast station, I have phi equal 0, then I walk by 75 centimeters and I have phi equals pi over 2, missing the information. I move by another 75 centimeter and now I have a phi is equal to pi and the cosine is equal to minus 1, I get my amplitude, and I move by another 75 centimeter, I have pi equals 3 pi over 2, and I miss my amplitude information. So you see here that this condition where phi equals pi over 2 will, up, uh, will uh, occur very often, and we need to find a solution to avoid this situation. The solution is that we need a second signal that is maximized when the cosine is cancelled. How do I maximize a signal when the cosine is cancelled? Well, if cosine of pi over 2 is equal to 0, then I will use the sine of pi over 2, which is equal to 1. So if I take a second term, which is the sine of the argument, it will be maximized when the first one is cancelled. So looking at the trigonometric circle, if I have two signals, one that is maximized when the other is cancelled, if I look uh, at my uh, cosine, which is on the x-axis, and my sine on the y-axis, we see that they are shifted by 90 degrees. So the solution is to say, rather than having a single local oscillator, we will be creating two signals, the local oscillator, will be mixed with the input signal that we wish to detect and this will be called the i component which is equal to the signal times cosine of omega hello and we create a second signal which is the sine and because the sine is shifted by 90 degree with respect to cosine we take this component here shifted by 90 degree and we take the same signal here S of T that was received by the antenna, and this will be a second signal Q, which is the output of the sine time sine of omega T. And because this time the multiplication of cosine by sine will create sine of phi, in one case we get cosine of the phase if omega LO is equal to omega RF, here we get the sine of the size, and we see that in both cases, when one quantity is maximized, the other is cancelled and uh, reciprocally. So this quantity here, i and q, will match the algebra of complex numbers, namely that q will be something that is amplitude of uh, sine of phi, the uh, i component is something like amplitude cosine of phi, and this matches complex number algebra where the amplitude is square root of i squared plus q squared and the uh, phase is arctangent of q over i. So this means that we will naturally express q and i as i plus jq, j squared equal minus 1, and throughout analysis of software-defined radio algorithm, we will see that we will handle i and q components matching uh, algebra of uh, IQ uh, uh, complex numbers. So this is actually what the radio frequency front end looks like. We have a variable gain amplifier and an IQ detector where local oscillator is shifted by 90 degrees to create the sine and cosine. The A2D converter is two synchronous channels sampling I and Q coefficients and uh, this bandwidth uh, sampling frequency FS will stream IQ data to be processed using the software-defined radio algorithms.
So this summarizes the basics of IQ demodulator. However, there's a challenge in that uh, the analog implementation of IQ demodulator will exhibit imbalance. Imbalance uh, means that your I component might be a signal of T times cosine your uh, local oscillator, but the Q component, the quadrature component, might exhibit a bit of imbalance uh, in the amplitude. The amplitude might not be one, but one plus epsilon, and your phase might not be equal, equal exactly to 90 degrees. You might have some phase shift. Now, an analog IQ imbalance needs to be calibrated and compensated for. And what we learn here on the uh, European Space Agency uh, Sentinel-1 uh, Spaceborne radar is that uh, the instruments receive module perform the demodulation in the digital domain. Therefore, IQ gain imbalance and non orthogonality corrections are no longer necessary. What does this mean? This means that actually you can perform IQ transposition as a two-step uh, operation where you first uh, roughly go from radio frequency band to base band using an analog mixer and a unique mixer that will not be prone to imbalance issue because there is a unique mixer. And after digitization, uh, perform a second complex uh, transposition using a numerically controlled oscillator uh, from IF bandwidth uh, to base band. Uh, what does this mean in terms of spectrum? We start with a signal uh, at uh, radio frequency RF, and this radio frequency signal is brought to baseband using this first uh, red mixing step. And on purpose, we leave an intermediate frequency. Now, this intermediate frequency is selected so that the signal completely lies inside the FS sampling frequency wide bandwidth, and yet all the signal will be away from the baseband here by uh, uh, keeping this high intermediate frequency away from zero hertz. Now, this first mixing step is a real transposition so that the spectrum is necessarily even, and we get these two copies of a signal, one in the positive frequency range and its mirror image in the negative frequency range, and these two need necessarily to be even because this is a real signal. Now, what we need is to take this signal and bring it to baseband. Now, we first convert these analog signals to digital signals, and the second transposition, the uh, complex transposition, is performed in the digital domain. Now, in the digital domain, when you write uh, as a digital algorithm cosine of uh, omega IFT and sine of omega IFT, these two quantities are necessarily of magnitude one, because that's the algorithm of cosine and sine, and by definition, there will be phase shifted by 90 degrees. So this means that now these two quantity of a spectra are shifted by IF, intermediate frequency, meaning that this guy comes to zero hertz, and this guy is shifted by IF away from the zero hertz. Uh, a new low-pass filter implemented as a digital low-pass filter will cancel this image uh, over here and keep only the uh, baseband signal. And this time, this transposition is not uh, plagued by uh, IQ imbalance because this last step was performed as an algorithm. So this is why Sentinel-1 claims there is no IQ imbalance issue to be solved because digital domains uh, uh, provides exactly quadrature conditions and uh, equal uh, amplitude uh, I and Q components. This uh, signal processing step beyond spaceborne radar is used in a free open source and open hardware uh, uh, vector network analyzer, the nano VNA. Nano VNA is implemented as follow. Actually, it's uh, interesting to have this open source uh, framework because by reading the source code available on, on this uh, website here, you can understand the details of how this is operating. So we will not get uh, too much in the details, but let us say that, that there is a, a dual channel local oscillator. This dual channel oscillator creates the radio frequency signal to uh, probe the device under test using the vector network analyzer, and the second signal, which is RF plus intermediate frequency. Now, this radio frequency signal will feed Wheatstown bridges either for transmission measurement, S21, or for reflection coefficient measurement, S11. And both signal, S11 and S21, will feed a audio codec, uh, uh, encoder, decoder. This audio codec 
operates at 48 kilohertz. It's uh, the same as would be used for a sound card. And the reference signal also feeds uh, this audio codec. Now, both signals have gone through mixers so that the radio frequency signal has been removed and only the inter intermediate frequency is left. So the uh, weights and breed output of the S11 and S21 are at FRF minus FRF plus IF, meaning that we get a signal that is shifted by IF, and this audio codec will sample a signal at uh, omega uh, IF. Again, this reference signal is also mixed between RF and IF, so that we get a copy uh, of a reference channel uh, to get the, uh, uh, the ratio S11 divided by reference or S21 divided by reference, again shifted by IF. And why do they do this? Because now this is a simple mixer and by having the last step as a mixer digitized inside the uh, codec here uh, or the STM32 microcontroller running the algorithm, we learn by reading the, the, the software that actually the frequency offset is 5 kilohertz and 5 kilohertz is indeed the value we found in DSP.C that performs the last transposition using a sine and cosine table. So the lookup table is by definition by exactly 90 degree phase shifted and same amplitude. And we end up with uh, the two quadrature component with no IQ imbalance. If you look at the output of this uh, uh, nano VNA, which actually operates in the uh, few megahertz to uh, 300 megahertz range, you get results that are very comparable with a Rodenschwarz state-of-the-art network analyzer for a cost of about 30 euros. So this uh, is quite an amazing piece of equipment using this basic principle that the final digitizing uh, step of IQ transposition is performed in the digital domain rather than the analog domain to remove this uh, IQ imbalance uncertainty. Now we've seen this first benefit of digital in solving the IQ imbalance uh, issue. What is the second uh, benefit that can be considered for a digitized uh, system, discrete time system? Aliasing. Aliasing is uh, the high, uh, results from the hypothesis that a discrete time uh, signal Fourier transform is periodic. What does it mean? It means that if we consider uh, the spectrum of the discrete time Fourier transform uh, of the digital system, we start with a signal uh, at baseband, so from minus uh, half the sampling rate, the Nyquist frequency FS over 2 to plus FS over 2, the Nyquist frequency positive, and then the spectrum repeats. Repeating means that if we consider the spectrum in this band over here, we assume that it repeats every FS sampling frequency in the positive direction and in the negative frequency. So here we have 0, FS over 2, we have FS sampling frequency over here, we have 2 FS over here, and so on. So the assumption of a periodic, uh, uh, of, of a discrete time sample uh, uh, Fourier transform is that the spectrum repeats every uh, FS sampling frequency. Now this can be used uh, beneficially if we know the structure of a spectrum. Here is an example of uh, measurements of the GRAV radar. GRAV radar is the space surveillance radar uh, located about 30 kilometers from our, our laboratory uh, uh, northeast of France. It's a bi-static radar. The receiver is south of France uh, and it uh, illuminates uh, the whole uh, space over uh, um, continental France. Uh, to observe uh, moving satellites. Now, in this case, it's a continuous wave radar. Uh, public literature claims to be about 400 kilowatts. Continuous wave, because when you illuminate satellites, you only need to know the trajectory uh, and the uh, Kepler law will define altitude and, uh, and the properties of the orbit. No need to have um, uh, timing reference, because only the velocity gives you all the parameters of the orbit of the satellite.
So uh, here in this case, we're not watching satellites, we're watching planes because we have 400 kilow kilowatts uh, radiating over any uh, spaceborne vehicle uh, over uh, in the sky of, uh, of uh, neighboring uh, areas around the laboratory. Here we have uh, fighter jets uh, because there is a military station close to the lab. Uh, here we have the commercial flights uh, slowly flying. Uh, vertical axis is the Doppler shift. Uh, uh, X axis is the time. So here we see that the Doppler starts positive as the flight is coming closer towards us, crosses the uh, zero Doppler. So this is uh, the by static. Uh, 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 radar uh, cancel, uh, speed cancellation condition and then the uh, Doppler shift continues as negative. Now, uh, in the case of a radar system, remember that the frequency shift introduced by a Doppler uh, reflected uh, pulse on a moving target is twice the frequency carrier, once as the wave is reaching the target, once as it is leaving the target, times the velocity over C. It happens that uh, the graph radar is at 143 mega, 43 megahertz, so that two times the uh, frequency is around 300, and 300 megahertz divided by the speed of light is about one. So this means that the Doppler shift in hertz is equal to the speed of the target in meter per second. So you see here that we have commercial flights between 250 and minus 250 meter per second. That's about plus or, plus, plus or minus one, 800 kilometer per hour, which is well consistent with the speed of commercial flights. In this case, what we're doing is we're clocking these uh, uh, sampling system using a white rabbit uh, synchronization network, which shares 10 megahertz and one pulse per second, one PPS pulses for synchronization. And uh, if you were to clock such systems using the white rabbit with a, a first mixing stage, then you would be challenged to uh, synchronize the various uh, mixing stage for frequency transposition. So if we introduce here this mixer that we've just seen earlier, then this local oscillator might be free drifting, even though you might be synchronizing the sampling frequency here of the A to D converter, these local oscillators, which are usually generated by phase locked loop, this PLL, we have a random phase offset depending on the condition, temperature, and the set point values. So these uh, local oscillator will be very difficult to synchronize. So what we're doing here is actually we're not introducing these two steps frequency transposition, we are using on purpose the alias of the uh, 143 megahertz in the uh, 200 mega sample per second uh, acquisition. So what does this mean in terms of spectrum? We start with the graph signal at 143.05 megahertz because we're sampling at 200 mega sample per second using an X310 ATIS research uh, front end radio frequency receiver. It means that we have an Iquis frequency at half the sampling frequency at 100 megahertz, and we create the image of 143 megahertz uh, at uh, observed in baseband at uh, 56.95 megahertz. So if we demodulate at 56.95 megahertz, which means that the FPGA will perform a frequency transposition to bring the signal at baseband, and because these are rather narrow band signals, we're only looking at plus or minus 600 hertz. Uh, on both sides of the carrier. So this means that the chances that another signal is aliased to this uh, frequency band is, is minus. This means that we get on each of these antennas only the signal of a graph radar and not on uh, other uh, unknown signals. Now this allows us to have a distributed passive radar because we can distribute time and frequency using the White Rabbit network. White Rabbit will allow you to distribute 10 megahertz reference frequency and the one PPS pulse to about 60 picoseconds. 60 picoseconds is much better than the uh, uh, eight nanosecond uh, period of the 143 megahertz signal so that we have a fraction of a uh, um, uh, period in terms of phase resolution. We can actually check what kind of uh, phase resolution that uh, gives us. If we say that we have uh, 60 picoseconds, so that's uh, 0.06 nanoseconds, that we multiply by 143 uh, in uh, gigahertz, so that would be 0.143, and we multiply this by 360 degrees. This means that we have about three degree angle uh, accuracy 
by using this uh, white rabbit synchronized network. So this is how we are actually going to share uh, the distributed uh, signal between the various A2D converter that can be widely spaced apart because White Rabbit will synchronize uh, devices separated by many hundred meters or kilometers. And by using this distributed radar system, we can uh, analyze direction of arrival uh, by using the phase shift. And from the phase shift, we can identify the direction where the signal is coming from. So here we have two pair of antenna, that's antenna one minus antenna number two, this is one minus three, and we see here that the phase starts as negative, it's light blue, it's shifted towards uh, one region, and then it becomes red, uh, so we have this different uh, direction of arrival, and here we have this different phase for the second antenna. Now why do you actually need a high stability frequency in addition to high stability timing? Timing will give you the phase that allows you to do this phase analysis and timing will make sure that the zero, Doppler, uh, zero hertz Doppler shift always remains at the same level. If your local oscillator were to drift over time, then this uh, line here using a TCXO will shift over time and the analysis of the Doppler shifted signal will be much more complex. So here is an example of using the alias where we actually only focus on synchronizing the A to D converter and we do not bother with an initial uh, phase lock loop uh, whose uh, set point might be varying over time and over conditions. So from, from, from this uh, consideration, we know how to uh, uh, timestamp signals with the uh, same uh, uh, time reference. But actually, can we generate uh, these uh, time references? Now, it's uh, classically known that uh, uh, the one uh, PPS, one pulse per second uh, signal can be generated by using the time dissemination capability of global navigation satellite systems, most significantly uh, global positioning system GPS. And one free open source implementation of a software defined radio receiver of GNSS signal is GNSS SDR. So GNSSDR will uh, be fed by radio frequency signals uh, coming from uh, uh, GPS constellations. Uh, they will uh, reach a software-defined radio receiver fitted with an active GPS antenna. All you need is to put a, a bias T between the radio frequency front end and the antenna to power the preamp. Uh, preamplifier, tune the radio frequency uh, SDR receiver to 157.542 uh, gigahertz, which is the, the local oscillator frequency for receiving uh, GPS L1. We sample the signal using the A2D converter, and all further processing is completed using the FPGA, possibly uh, sharing the data in the case of the ATS Research B210 for a USB free link towards a general purpose uh, central processing unit, in this case, for example, a Raspberry Pi 4 single board computer running a GNSSDR. So what we needed here was to actually generate the one PPS, not only be told by GNSSDR that our local oscillator time offset was that many microseconds off with respect to GPS time, we wanted to materialize the one PPS. Uh, now what we realized when we were trying to generate the one PPS using the Raspberry Pi is that we have no idea what is the time at which the samples are processed by a GNSSDR. Indeed, uh, after uh, acquisition and sampling by the A2D converter, the FPGA will introduce a deterministic latency due to its own processing, but any communication protocol, whether USB free, whether uh, gigabit Ethernet, will be asynchronous. Uh, furthermore, the general purpose central processing unit running GNSSDR might be interrupted, the scheduler might decide that another task will be preempting uh, GNSSDR, so we have no idea what time is uh, running the, the general purpose CPU. So this CPU clock is uh, not able to generate the, the one PPS. The only place where we can actually know what is the sampling time and at which date the data were collected was at the A2D converter level. Any processing beyond the A2D converter are asynchronous and only the A2D converter timestamps data and because the data is assumed to be uh, a, a continuous stream of data, we knew that the time interval between two samples is equal to inverse of the sampling rate. Any information beyond the A2D converter is lost in terms of time. So if we wish to generate the PPS, the only place is to tune the clock running the A2D converter, and in the case of the B210, that also happens to be tuning the FPGA in which we have implemented the one PPS generator. So by feeding 
the A to D converter clock with the command generated by the GNSSDR estimate between its local copies of the pseudorandom sequence. As we have seen earlier, a pseudorandom sequence is used for spreading the spectrum. That's exactly what a GPS is doing. So GNSSDR is running its local copy of the pseudorandom sequence at a data rate that is equal to the sampling rate of the A2D converter. And if the uh, correlation peak from uh, the uh, GPS signal uh, shifts with respect to this local copy, then GNSSDR will inform us of this uh, shift of uh, time, local time with respect to GPS time. Now, this signal can uh, be used to steer the, uh, the clock, clocking the A2D converter and the FPGA, and uh, we, uh, we assess the performance by comparing the output of our own one PPS generator in the FPGA clocked by this output using a frequency counter whose second reference is a U-Block uh, GPS receiver. What you see here is the output. The blue curve is the free running uh, TCXO uh, where uh, the, uh, there is no control over GPS. So we just observe the drift. In the case of the orange curve, we are controlling uh, the uh, clock signal here with respect to the uh, U-Blocks uh, um, uh, signal here. So the, we are comparing two GPS signals and the uh, uh, purple and yellow curves are comparisons of the U-blocks or our own output with a hydrogen maser. Now, because a hydrogen maser is uh, not a primary ref reference, it will be slightly offset with, resp with respect to GPS time. This is this slight slope that you observe. But looking at the Allen deviation, we see that our own implementation of GNSSDR uh, output of a one PPS does exhibit the same kind of performance as a U-blocks receiver with respect to the hydrogen maser counter. And actually the performance is really limited by a GPS time transfer and neither by the U-blocks nor by our implementation. Uh, in this uh, three corner hat uh, analysis, we see that each uh, double comparison exhibits the same kind of performance. So it is the GPS time transfer capability that limits uh, Allen deviation. So we have here a one over tau uh, uh, Allen deviation decay, uh, which is consistent with the uh, control of the uh, signal clocking the A2D converter with the uh, primary references of the uh, GPS tiered uh, hydrogen masers, space uh, hydrogen masers. So this demonstrates that the clock signal that will allow you to timestamp uh, software defined radio samples is only at the A2D converter level and any uh, time beyond the A2D converter is lost because of the asynchronous processes. Now, this is most significant also in closed loop control delay and control systems. This is an example of an optical link stabilization control loop where we have two uh, reference and uh, measurement channels uh, at, uh, at a frequency offset. This frequency offset is removed. This is all running in an FPGA by a numerically controlled oscillator, a complex valued. And we uh, feed the uh, control system using a PI controller. So we have two channels. We have two PI controllers. Uh, this PI controller is expanded and shifted to match uh, the word uh, driving the output numerically controlled oscillator. And this numerically controlled oscillator will drive uh, an acousto-optic modulator. Uh, we also feed uh, these data to a general purpose uh, central processing unit for further analysis. So here again, the only time when we know when the data have been sampled is at the A to D converter here, and we assume that the data stream is uh, contiguous so that we have an idea of what is the time interval between two samples at the PI controller, and we can analyze uh, the performance of the uh, four control loop. Now, the main issue with this control loop is with the low pass filter and decimation here right after the mixer. All the other steps, this is a single clock, uh, additional uh, shifting and uh, offset compensation is a single clock cycle, but this finite impulse response filter here will introduce some sort of delay. And delay introduces phase. Phase in a closed loop system means risk of oscillation. So well, let us look more closely at this uh, low pass filter here. If we look at the low pass filter implemented as a finite impulse response, selected because it is unconditionally stable, then this finite impulse response filter implemented over n uh, coefficients, n being driven by the transition width, so the, the bandwidth from the bandpass filter to the cutoff frequency, 
uh, define this number n of coefficients, and we will introduce a time delay of n times sampling periods and a phase shift which is equal to uh, n over 2 times the uh, sampling period for a symmetric fear filter. So this means that if we increase the number of coefficients, indeed we improve the rejection capability because we have a sharper uh, low-pass filter. We are able to uh, more quickly reject unwanted components in the cutoff band. However, we see that the phase shift here raises, uh, the slope rises as the number of coefficient increases. This is on the 14-bit red pitaya fitted with a Zinc 1010, which can only handle 32 or 64 coefficient uh, fear filters. This is the red pitaya 16-bit with uh, its uh, Zinc 7020 uh, FPGA, which can handle up to 128 coefficients. And we see again that the slope of the phase shift increases as the number of coefficient rises. Uh, of course, uh, this is the unwrapped phase observed on the network analyzer, and unwrapping a phase when the signal is dropping becomes very complex. So this is one of the issues is despite having a digital uh, electronics with very fast clocking rate, uh, several hundred mega sample per second, the fact that we need to introduce a few tens or a few hundred coefficients mean that we reduce the uh, loop bandwidth by that uh, factor of the sampling rate. So if we have uh, something like 100 uh, megahertz uh, uh, the, the sampling rate and we have 100 coefficients, the loop bandwidth will drop to a fraction of a megahertz. So actually, uh, digital electronics will bring you high long-term stability, but it will only have loop bandwidth of a few hundred kilohertz up to a few megahertz because of this time delay introduced by the many uh, coefficients needed to perform uh, digital processing. Another drawback of uh, digital and software-defined radio is the limited dynamic range. We introduced earlier that the faster an A2D converter, the fewer the bits. And uh, the uh, range, uh, if you take uh, 20 log of the 2 to the minus n with n the number of bits, well, two to, uh, 20 log of 2 to, uh, uh, two to the 8 or 256 will be 48 bits. With 16 bits, we reach 96 dB dynamic range. This means that if in the uh, analyzed bandwidth, a strong signal is 96 dB uh, stronger than the weakest signal, then the weaker signal will be below the quantization uh, threshold and cannot be detected. So this is a major limitation, especially for radar application, where the return signal drops as the fourth power of the distance. And this uh, low dynamic range might not be an issue in a uh, benchtop experiment, but for over-the-air uh, reception, this will be a limitation. Finally, the last limitation we wish to introduce is a representation of, of the numbers. And again, here, the open source framework of uh, GNU Radio helps us understand uh, some of the limitation of the representation of floating point numbers. Now, computers should only uh, handle integers. Integers are uh, uh, deterministic arithmetic. Uh, floating point numbers are always uh, misbehaving uh, because of their limited representation and in inaccurate representation. And here is a demonstration of the uh, trigonometric function. In blue curve here is the sine wave of, uh, this is a sample, a signal sample at 48 kilosampel per second. The blue curve here is a 440 hertz signal that is generated on the sound cards. And what you see here is that when the center uh, time is zero, uh, this is a 40, uh, 440 hertz centered on zero time delay, then uh, we have a nice sine wave. If we take the same sine wave, but time shifted by 0 0.1 second, meaning that the argument of the trigonometric function is not just 440 times the time, but 440 times the times plus 0.1 second times the uh, sampling rate, then you already see the red curve here, which is discontinuous. If rather than 0.1 second, you go one second in the future, you see the yellow curve here, which is very discontinuous. What is happening here? What is happening is that sine and cosine, the trigonometric function, have a limited resolution. And by feeding these uh, trigonometric function with large arguments, then their resolution drops drastically. So in this case, for example, you define time as being 
index number, zero to infinity, or a bit lower because infinity is very large, divide, divided by the sampling frequency fs. So this gives you your time step ts, uh, uh, period of uh, sampling, and your numerically controlled oscillator will be equal to exponential of j2 pi uh, uh, f uh, frequency that you wish to output times t, t being sampled at fs. And what you see here is that if we wish to do a frequency transposition, we take the signal and we multiply it by the local oscillator. This is your digital electronic uh, local oscillator uh, transposition. And now the issue is that if you let the time run, well, your local oscillator loses resolution. And this is where we learn from new radio that new radio is careful to increment the, set, the phase and always keep a phase between minus pi and pi, where the trigonometric function has the best resolution. If you let time increase and go well above pi, then your sine uh, function will, uh, uh, resolution will decrease and you will have a poor, uh, um, quality local oscillator. So here is an example where you need to be careful about handling the phase. Of course, this is because uh, new radio handles floating point number. You might reduce this impact by using double resolution floating point, uh, 64 bit, but this only uh, uh, extends the range and doesn't solve the problem. And furthermore, this will increase the computational load to 64-bit floating point numbers instead of 32-bit uh, point numbers. So these are some of the drawbacks of software-defined radio, limited range, uh, time delay, limited bandwidth, and limited resolution due to the floating point number description. One last limitation of uh, the uh, software-defined radio hardware that we've described with its direct uh, conversion is the so-called uh, local oscillator leakage. Local oscillator leakage comes from the fact that a mixer is not perfect. A mixer, that was initially the reason for introducing the super heterodyne architecture that we introduced in the very beginning, when uh, Armstrong introduced the super heterodyne architecture that was to avoid uh, oscillation of the uh, amplifier that was located after the mixer. And in this case, what you see is that your local oscillator will leak some energy either uh, directly through the uh, um, uh, amplifier here and back frequency by definition are at the same frequency and they will create a DC offset. Uh, you might have a strong interferer or you actually might have some local oscillator leakage through the antenna, time delayed and returning through the amplifier. So this local oscillator leakage is very, very well visible on the low cost digital video broadcast receivers, uh, direct sampling systems that we discussed earlier. If you zoom into the uh, X axis, into the frequency axis, you see here the local oscillator leakage that this peak at zero hertz. And if you have a signal that you want to analyze close to the local oscillator uh, leakage here, well, this is your red curve. The signal that you want to analyze here is the phase of the signal is polluted by the local oscillator leakage that this high frequency uh, uh, component on the phase uh, measurement. So what we can do is actually we can introduce So what we do under investigation is within the uh, baseband, so within the half a sampling rate minus half a sampling rate, and then we do a frequency transposition digitally. And this operation is so common that is implemented in the radio as a frequency transposition followed by the low-pass filter that you see here in blue. And this frequency transposition plus low pass filter is called the frequency translating free filter. Then we low pass, and if we display in blue here the phase after removing the LO leakage and bringing the signal to baseband, we have here the phase clean from this local oscillator uh, uh, pollution. Now, this can be demonstrated, this uh, frequency translating free filter can be demonstrated uh, in another uh, practical. Um, analysis of uh, uh, FM band uh, listening that we started earlier, and this can be done for listening to two radio frequency stations simultaneously. So starting from the flowchart that we had uh, finished with earlier, 
we take now this uh, 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 dual FM station uh, listening chart. So we have here our radio frequency source. The radio frequency source uh, feeds the low-pass filter. And if we look at uh, spectrum here, we see that we have a second station at minus 700 kilohertz. So what we might want to do is listen to the second station by uh, doing this frequency transposition. And this is implemented by the uh, frequency translating fear filter. So what we're going to do is shift by uh, the 700 kilohertz over here. This is the frequency transposition of the local oscillator. And we select the taps as being equal to 1. Remember that the taps are the fear filter. So we say that x, y is equal of sum of x with a sum of x equal to 1. Well, you see that the output is equal to the input, and we just copied the output to the input. And now we see that what used to be at minus 700 kilohertz has been shifted to baseband. So now we have two signals. We have a first FM station centered on 0 hertz, and we have a second FM station that has been shifted to, uh, to, to 0 hertz. So now we wish to filter this second FM station by introducing a low-pass filter. This low-pass filter, this time, we will define the cutoff frequency is a fixed value, 120 kilohertz is about the bandwidth of, of the FM broadcast station, broadcast station. And what we see now is that we will have the, um, the two channels uh, correctly selected uh, by applying this fear filter. So we apply the taps that we have just defined. And now we've got the first station centered on zero hertz, which has been featured, and the second station as well. So now we have these two stations that we can listen to simultaneously because they have been both brought to baseband and they are both uh, filtered out. So if we wish to listen to two stations, what we actually can do is uh, have a linear combination of these two station audio frequency output at the output of the FM demodulators. We have these two FM demodulators uh, generating this uh, sound. Remember that we sample at 48 kilohertz times 32. So we have a decimation of eight, decimation of four in both uh, uh, processing steps. And now that we have these two outputs at 48 kilo samples a second, we can decide to multiply each one of these outputs by a fixed gain. And this gain will actually be a variable k. This variable k that will be selected between zero and one will tell us the fraction of signal from the first station or the second station that will feed the uh, sound part. So we take the second station as 1 minus k. Uh, now we feed the sum of these two channels uh, at the audio output. So we sum these two signals. They must be selected as being floating point numbers. And uh, we take this to the sound part. Now that we've assembled all these blocks, we can play and we will listen alternatively to one station or another by tuning this parameter k. We make it tunable, dynamically tunable between 0 and 1 with uh, uh, 0.02 steps. And that will allow us to listen to one station or another alternatively. <laughs> stations. First station with a 90 kilohertz the FM indicator and the stereo indicator. Second station. Back to both stations. And again. Here we can listen to as many signals as there are myself. in the sample date, so the bandwidth that was uh, collecting the baseband. So, beyond listening to two stations, why is this uh, local oscillator leakage an issue? Well, here is an optical uh, measurement setup where we wish to measure the out-of-plane displacement of surface acoustic wave transducers. So this is your classical uh, measurement setup with uh, two spectrum analyzer, two synthesizer, a lock-in amplifier, a rather fancy experiment where uh, uh, a laser source 
shines on a sample which is vibrating at radio frequency out of plane. This is a Michelson interferometer with an acousto optic modulator to compensate for low phase shift due to uh, varying environments, so a heterodyne measurement. And here, this beam splitter will recombine the direct signal with the return signal, losing the front uh, lens as a mirror uh, in front of the laser here. And these two signals, the one reflected by the sample and the direct signal coming from the laser, will interfere on this optical photodetector. So this setup here will create two sidebands, one sideband at uh, twice the uh, optic modulator's uh, frequency signal that is sampled by one arm of the locking amplifier, and a second signal which is at twice the optic modulator plus the uh, device under test frequency, and if we mix again by the device under test, we come back to twice omega zero. So these two frequencies are the same, and we can analyze this, but instead of using an expensive locking amplifier, we can implement this using a dual-channel software-defined radio receiver. Now, this uh, is done here using the B210 software-defined radio receiver. We see here that the uh, setup is reduced. We don't need all these uh, dedicated hardware anymore. All we need is the uh, photodiode output and the driving, the signal driving, the surface acoustical device, the acoustic device here under test. We have the two inputs, and by using the two inputs, if we look at the magnitude of the first channel, we have a higher frequency. By using the magnitude of the second channel, we have the uh, sideband, which is modulated by the uh, uh, vibrating sample. The ratio of these two quantity gives us the vibration amplitude, and the phase give the phase difference gives us the velocity. So this is a way of replacing all this fancy hardware with a single B210 uh, 1200 euro uh, radio frequency receiver. Now the challenge in this implementation is that uh, in the uh, context of uh, 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 mapping the displacement of the sample, we have a, a moving position here, here, and the challenge is how do we synchronize the software-defined radio reception with uh, the motion of the table. And this is valid actually for any scanning probe microscopy measurement. And what we're doing is we use an external uh, framework. In this example, it's a, it's a, a new octave, but you could also do this in Python. So we stream the data using a 0MQ uh, stream. It's a, a UDP-like stream where the data will be sent from a GNU radio to an external software. UDP means either there is a listener and the data will be processed. If there is no listener, the data will just be lost to bed. And in this case, this 0MQ publish is uh, connected to a, a, a GNU Octave 0MQ subscribe, meaning that whenever the data here are streamed and will be received by uh, GNU Octave, then we will process the data. In this case, we take the ratio of the data and we save the magnitude and the phase. And if uh, GNU Octave decides that the collection data collection at this given point of the sample is enough, then we will just lose the data streamed by the GNU Radio uh, uh, data stream here. And Octave will take care of moving the table to the new position before collecting the data from this new position. So you see here that you can very efficiently use external software to interface with new radio. New radio takes care of all the radio frequency digital processing and external software, Python, new octave, will take care of some more fancy processing or some asynchronous processing. This is the same technique that we're using for synthetic aperture radar. When the antenna needs to be moved, the octave moves the antenna, uh, uh, new radio takes care of uh, radio frequency signal processing. This is an example of the output of such a setup. This is a bulk acoustic resonator. Here you see uh, the carrier frequency, which is the reflectivity with the electrode. This is a sideband with uh, the sum of the reflectivity plus the acoustic motion. If we take the ratio of these two quantities, you've got the amplitude and the phase of the motion of the uh, quartz crystal resonator. This is out of play displacement of high overtone, making nice pattern. This is a surface acoustic wave resonator. This is the reflectivity, so the intensity of the reflected power. Two resonators. Uh, this is a sensor, uh, SCS-10 uh, uh, sensor, dual resonator temperature sensor. We see here that at one frequency, uh, 433 megahertz, one resonator is excited, and the other frequency, 434 megahertz, the other resonator is excited. And here we see some spurious mode where uh, 
the spurious mode is actually on the, on the 433 megahertz. And if you look at the phase of the signal, so this is the magnitude, and if we take the magnitude and we look at the phase, we have the acoustic velocity, and the acoustic velocity of the unwrapped phase gives you the Rayleigh wave velocity on quartz, which matches the tabulated value of the Rayleigh wave on, on the quartz substrate. So you see here how you can make some uh, optical measurement using software defined radio. Finally, we conclude this set of demonstration by combining multiple receivers. We have seen earlier that we can have dual channel receivers. This is using the low cost uh, DVB-T receivers uh, used as a general purpose software defined radio receiver. This is a presentation that we uh, achieved thanks to uh, the work of Weike Feng and Gregory Cherniak in uh, the laboratory of Motoyuki Sato uh, in Sendai in Japan, where we wanted to do some uh, passive radar measurement. In the passive radar measurement, you have one illumination source, and this illumination source is a non-cooperative source. So in this case, it was a TV tower, and this TV tower was illuminating targets, and these targets would reflect some signal back to a, a receiver. Uh, so this TV station is a non-cooperative source, and it's transmitting a signal unknown at any given time, but it's a, a broadband signal. So if on your receiver side you have a second antenna looking at the direct signal, this will be your reference signal, this will be your surveillance signal, and by correlating the reference signal with the surveillance signal, you can find the time delay uh, and hence the distance uh, uh, of this target with respect to your receiver. Now the challenge is that if this target is moving, it will introduce, in addition, due to its velocity v, uh, a Doppler shift delta f, and this Doppler shift will prevent the correlation from accumulating energy. So what you need to do is you have a two-dimensional chart. These two-dimensional charts in the y-axis are the time delay tau, in the x-axis are the Doppler shift this uh, frequency doppler here, and if you search for correlation peaks, in this example here we had some uh, ships uh, coming in or leaving uh, the port of Sendai, we have here for the negative doppler shift, so a ship uh, going away, you see here that it's at this location, then it has shifted to a larger location, so it's indeed moving away, and the doppler shift help you to differentiate the target from the clutter. The clutter is all this reflection at uh, zero hertz, so the static reflection. So here you've got both time in the y-axis and frequency, which is actually range and Doppler achieved by synchronizing two of these uh, DVB-T receivers. The challenge here is that even if you synchronize the frequency, again, as we mentioned earlier, the set point of the phase lock loop will drift over time. And in addition, USB is an asynchronous port so that it will introduce a random time delay. But the stream being contiguous, if this time delay is constant, meaning we stream for 0MQ UDP uh, publish subscribe, then the receiver can calibrate for this uh, time offset. And this time offset can be removed from the correlation peaks here. So this shows you where time and frequency can be addressed using software defined radio. Finally, we wish to show that sound card can be used as a software defined radio source. This is analyzing the very low frequency signals from DCF77 in Meinflingen in Germany, MSF in uh, England, uh, LoRaN in England as well, or uh, the French TDF. And in this case, we're using the sound card of a laptop PC, uh, that sample, that uh, 192 kilo sample per second, that's 192 kilohertz. And you see here, for example, DCF77. So what we do is we have uh, the very low frequency antenna. It's a coil antenna with its uh, uh, driving a circuit uh, to uh, convert the high impedance to a low impedance, able to feed uh, left audio input of a sound card, a GPS signal feeds the right audio signal as a time reference. And what you see here is the amplitude of DCF77 and the phase of, uh, the phase of DCF77. Why are we inter interested in the phase? Because since 1988 and this presentation by Hetzel, we know that uh, DCF77, in addition to the narrow band amplitude signal, transmits a broader uh, band uh, phase signal, and this broader base fa phase signal will allow, again, to improve time uh, resolution. So what we do is we take the audio output of a sound card. This is a uh, baseband at zero hertz. We get the 77 kilohertz signal, which is within 
uh, sampling rate, and we shifted 77.5 kilohertz. It's an even spectrum. It's a real spectrum that we acquired. So plus 77 or minus 77 is the same. And you see that when we shift using a frequency translating field filter, 77.5 kilohertz to baseband, of course, the image is shifted as well due to the periodicity of a spectrum. It is shifted and it brings to nine, minus 95 kilohertz. And using a low pass filter, we select only DCF77. This is not to scale because in this example, the low pass filter is a cutoff uh, frequency of 40 hertz uh, and uh, a rejection frequency uh, above 50 hertz. So this is the signal that we wish to analyze. And uh, from this phase and amplitude, we can deduce uh, a fine time of flight. And this is an example, amplitude and phase. So you see that the phase correlation is much narrower. The time definition is much better than the amplitude. And actually, this uh, experiment has been running now for the last four years. This was published uh, in 2018, uh, using the data that had been collected at the end of 2016 and 2017. And actually, this experiment is running so well that this poor laptop was forgotten at the corner of, la of our lab until I was preparing this tutorial and I thought that maybe I would like to fetch the data which had been collected since 2018 up to uh, the date at which this uh, presentation is recorded. This is the frequency offset uh, of the sound card with respect to DCF77. And because we compare GPS with DCF77, actually this time delay here between GPS, 1PPS, and DCF77 uh, cancels or rejects the sound card frequency drift. So what you see here is the time deviation of the signal over four years, and we are now reaching 10 to the minus 12 due to the very long integration time and obviously no long-term drift. How do you practically implement this processing? This is done in GNU Octave. So actually, the Python script that was generated using uh, GNU Radio Companion is executed every minute. It collects a one minute uh, sample. This signal is uh, red. We have on the left channel DCF77. On the right channel, we have a GPS. So we take both channels of a stereo signal. We first uh, roughly uh, transpose by 77.5 kilohertz the signal to baseband and we low pass filter using FRLS and filter of new octave. We create a new time after decimation by a factor of 59 to focus only on baseband and reject the unwanted image. Then we have a fine frequency estimate by looking at the maximum of the fast, uh, fast Fourier transform. This uh, analysis takes the fast Fourier transform, search for the maximum of the fast rate transform. So that's the maximum of uh, magnitude of the fast rate transform. And we do a frequency transposition by this course, frequency offset estimate. And having done this course frequency estimate, we finally look at the linear drift of the frequency uh, of a phase, which is actually the frequency offset. And by losing the polynomial fit with the first order coefficient, we reject the linear time offset and the uh, constant time offset. And having removed this coarse frequency offset and the fine frequency offset, we finally load the linear feedback shift register pseudorandom sequence that is documented in Hetzel's paper, uh, and we cross correlate the DCF77 phase corrected from its O drift sources with this uh, linear feedback shift register pseudorandom sequence. And this will give you these correlation peaks once every second, which you can compare with the one PPS. And this gives you uh, the fine estimate of the time delay introduced by DCF77. One fascinating aspect of uh, digital scene processing is that you can go well beyond analog processing. Uh, let us take the example of uh, FM demodulation, frequency modulated demodulation. In the classical approach, you would take a phase locked loop and implement a frequency to voltage converter using the PLL. And actually what uh, Denis Pederov demonstrated in his presentation at the 2015 FOSDEM is that if you consider the signal that you've received, which is amplitude exponential of J delta omega, delta omega, the frequency offset between the local oscillator and the emitting local oscillator T, uh, the time, so that's your linear uh, phase drift, uh, which is the frequency offset plus uh, the phase, which is uh, the um, frequency modulated signal, so integral from minus infinity to t of uh, the, the modulated signal that is to be transmitted, with d, the deviation, the frequency modulation deviation, 
then he demonstrates that uh, taking the product of the sample at the time n times the complex conjugate of at times n plus 1 is equal to the exponential uh, if we take the uh, time signal n multiplied by complex conjugate of time signal n plus 1 then we see that the j delta omega t becomes uh, t at times n plus 1 minus t at times n that's uh, sampling period ts and the integral from n is infinity to tn minus uh, in, uh, integral from minus infinity to tn plus 1 we're left with nts uh, to n plus 1 ts of the modulation signal and the integral from uh, the previous step to the next step if we take the rectangular approximation of the integral is equal to ts the period uh, of uh, sampling multiplied by the modulation signal at n times ts and so we see that taking the argument of this expression we are left with the frequency offset which is the uh, 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 voltage uh, offset introduced by the frequency offset in the PLL in the frequency to voltage converter plus, a uh, uh, plus again uh, d times ts multiplied by the signal that we wish to observe and uh, by multiplying this by 1 over ts we get actually the signal that was modulated so this means that we might be able to uh, get the audio signal with a single line of MATLAB processing of the signal re recorded as we were looking at the FM signal. So can we demonstrate this on the data that we recorded uh, previously when uh, looking at FM station? Uh, when we were recording the FM station, we had set the uh, sampling rate at uh, f uh, audio frequency times 32. And because we're looking at the output uh, of the uh, low pass filter, is divided by 8. Actually it's interesting to notice uh, how much data is being sampled. So the sampling frequency is uh, 192 uh, kilo sample per second and every sample is uh, a, a float, so 4 bytes and I and Q complex, so that means 1.5 um, uh, uh, 1 mega sample per second and this means that if we sample 15 seconds worth of uh, data we have 2.3 mega uh, 23 mega samples and if we look this is indeed what we actually expect from the data that we saved on this on this record so what we can do now is we can uh, read uh, the uh, data that were uh, uh, stored so uh, GNU radio provides the means for reading a complex number stored in a binary file and having done that we can create the uh, solution as Danny Bedroff uh, told, taught us by taking the samples until the end and multiplying by the samples uh, complex conjugate uh, uh, previous uh, samples so to the end and uh, we take this now this solution is a very broadband signal so we need to create a low pass filter so we create uh, a low pass filter that we've actually cut off with 256 uh, coefficients, a uh, random number, uh, reasonable, uh, something that will cut off at 18 kilohertz um, because we know that at 19 kilohertz there is the tone indicating that we have a, a, a stereo signal and remember that uh, MATLAB uh, samples uh, from 0 to 1 so your half sampling frequency, your NICRI frequency is FS over 2. Now we have here uh, the layout of the filter. We say that it's a low pass filter by taking 0, 0. And uh, now we can take, uh, uh, this needs to uh, load the um, signal uh, processing toolbox. And then we can apply the filters uh, by taking that. So is the filter of uh, a fear with uh, A equals 1 of Sol and we save the uh, resulting uh, data stream into uh, a uh, WAV file so we can say that this is out.wave uh, with uh, Sol and we say that it's a 48 kilo sample per second uh, data set if we actually only keep one out of four sample because we still have 
uh, uh, this uh, oversampling. Now that we have said out.wave, we can actually launch new radio companion and just read the wave file for playing. So we take this new uh, queue, we take the wave file, so wave read, wave source, and this will be sent to the audio sync, audio sync over here at a data rate of 48 kilo sample per second and we read the file out.wave and this is it we can save this and it is all working very well Let us conclude with some of the available hardware. Uh, we've uh, discussed the Red Pitaya. This is a, a, a non-exhaustive uh, list of uh, either open hardware or well-documented uh, sources. The Red Pitaya is not open hardware, but it's well enough documented that we can understand its radio frequency front end. This is a uh, since there is no frequency transposition, 14-bit or 16-bit that was uh, specifically designed for using higher Nyquist zones uh, using aliasing. We've got uh, more open hard platforms such as HackRF, BetaRef, Lime SDR. Uh, in general, the ATUS research hardware is well documented. All schematics are available on their website. DVBTs uh, uh, will be less than 10 euro. Uh, the analog device Pluto SDR, which is a demonstrator of the AD9366 um, radio frequency front end, is uh, less than 150 euro uh, with a much broader frequency range. Be aware though, that the AD9366 uh, uh, radio frequency front end is incoherent. There is a different local oscillator for the transmitter and receiver, so you cannot use the transmitter as uh, the radio frequency for a radar system, a coherent radar system, unlike the Lime. Uh, chips, uh, these will be incoherent. You can use a sound card, and if size matters, now you've got the Fairwaves XRX with its tiny dimensions of 30 times 51 millimeters, best suited for radar systems aboard uh, unmanned aerial vehicles. Actually, if you want to implement the utmost dream of uh, uh, software defined radio, you might actually use radio frequency grade oscilloscope. We provide a GNU radio source for uh, radio frequency grade oscilloscopes. Uh, of course, these will be discontinuous data streams because no oscilloscope can stream the several gigasample per second, but at least you've got the whole frequency band of your oscilloscope. So, uh, selecting your hardware is a trade off between bandwidth, resolution, and cost. So to conclude this presentation, we try to introduce a free open source software infrastructure of new radio. We try to show how we could uh, address uh, multiple problems using this uh, uh, consistent framework. Uh, we try to emphasize the benefits of software defined radio processing in terms of stability, flexibility and reconfigurability. We use the same hardware to address as wide uh, widely different problems as uh, GNSS 1 PPS reception or generation uh, or uh, time transfer in radar systems or DCF77 reception. Um, so in this context, you invest in hardware once and you display uh, the, the, this hardware for most uh, investigations. Uh, we've seen that the carrier frequency is uh, 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 cancelled early by the radio frequency front end and only bandwidth matters. But the challenge of uh, deploying software-defined radio infrastructures lies in the complexity of combining FPGA, HDL languages, uh, general purpose CPU, C++, or Python, user interface, and networking. We've seen that some time delay is introduced by process The uh, loop frequency is actually limited to a, a small fraction of this processing bandwidth. And GNU Radio is now available on multiple uh, embedded platform. In this example here, we have uh, the B210 from ATUS Research uh, feeding uh, one Raspberry Pi. This other Raspberry Pi is fed by an RTL SDR dongle, uh, GNU Radio running on the Raspberry Pi, and the Raspberry Pi connected to a general purpose computer for further processing. So uh, the, the embedded approach now is applicable to uh, GNU Radio. 
Throughout this presentation, we have not addressed the benefits of software defined radio for educational and training purposes. It is our belief that any experiment that is not implementable at the graduate level is not worth discussing. And what we see here is that using software defined radio, we can actually implement all these experiments, whether optics, radio frequency processing, time transfer, ray, radar systems, using very basic hardware and embedded uh, processing units. So. Uh, we believe that software defined radio is ideal for combining uh, education at the, inter inter at the intersection of computer science, radio frequency, and digital signal processing. And in this context of education, here is a selected uh, set of literature. Travis Collins and his colleagues at Analog Device have written software defined radio for engineers based on the Pluto SDR. It's an amazing uh, book uh, that is freely available on their website. Unfortunately, it will use uh, MATLAB as a closed source uh, uh, software framework, but at least the underlying principles are applicable. Uh, we have uh, some of the basics uh, for digital signal processing. Uh, uh, the a scientist and engineer, engineer's guide to digital signal processing is available on the web. Uh, the Tesson Amasar uh, packet radio is one of the classics, as is Alliance. Uh, Proakis and Oppenheim are the standard textbooks. Um, Kybor and Kaplan are dedicated to GPS uh, analysis and, and all that we've dis been discussing about GNSSDR understanding generation of PPS is brought from these books. Uh, you will find a lot of resources on the OpenCourseWare MIT web server and every year GNU Radio Conference, the GRCon, as well as the free open source developer meeting, FOSDEM, free open source dev room will welcome attendances. Uh, this is probably one of the best uh, conferences to attend where people will share information and not just need to show off, but actually have some uh, insight into technical issues to discuss. So with this conclusion, I thank you for your attention and hope you will enjoy uh, experimental with software defined radio by yourself. Thank, <clears throat> thank you, Jean Michel. Can, can you hear me? Okay. Um, so now it is expected to have uh, the live uh, Q&A uh, session. So uh, um, I don't see any question in the chat. And uh, um, I have some question, but first uh, we should uh, wait a little bit for Jean-Michel that at the moment is not connected. Um, Jan, can yes. you hear me? Um, so uh, in the chat, uh, there are no, no question. Uh, is no. that the right uh, place to, to... Well, it could be a place, but uh, there is not that many uh, attendees uh, so far. I, I wanted to yeah, ask a question, but uh, Jean-Michel is not back. Uh, yeah, it was there uh, just uh, a few minutes uh, before. Uh, yeah. I have some questions, but uh, I haven't seen uh, people in uh, in this uh, in this. No. Uh, but uh, but this I, is recorded though, so um, yeah. So. so probably many other people are, has already seen have already seen it. Yes, and if we ask question, it is recorded, and the answers will be uh, will be available, accessible. Uh, yes. Um, so, so we can. Cla <laughs> Cla Claudio, do do you have Jean Michel's uh, phone number, for example? Uh, no, I uh, I don't have it with me. It's quite strange. I got. Uh, but uh, Enrico Rubiola has, so I. I just call uh, Enrico Rubiola. Or on the website, maybe.
Hello, Jean Michel. So, uh, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. So, let me thank you uh, for this excellent tutorial. Uh, because uh, um, an attendee uh, by uh, watching this tutorial, uh, in addition uh, to have a, a complete picture about the final radio, now uh, he can he know uh, the basics and also how to face uh, more advanced uh, um, applications, as well as uh, very detailed uh, references. So thank you, thank you, thank you again. So uh, uh, now uh, this is the live uh, Q&A, but uh, I don't see at the moment any, any question in, in the chat. I don't know if uh, there is another way to, to- But we can ask the question now. Yeah, yes. <laughs> and uh, so I have many questions for uh, about uh, software defined radio. I know that uh, also Jan has, uh, has, has some or, or many. So the, the, the first uh, the first uh, question is uh, is uh, how big was the the impact of uh, software defined radio in the way you approach your experiments uh, because it is a very different way of uh, thinking and so I expect that uh, the role uh, in uh, in the way you work uh, is relevant can can you comment about this From my perspective, the main benefit of, uh, of SDR is the flexibility, the ability to test many new ideas in a very, uh, first of all, having saved, I, I was just, for example, playing with uh, the two-way satellite frequency and time transfer. And after recording like five minutes worth of data, I can spend afternoons uh, processing the data, testing all sorts of analysis on the same data set. Uh, so I think this is one of the benefits. And the second thing is, is of course, testing. I was trying to show in the video um, how copy pasting to multiple channels, the same algorithm is just a matter of writing, of, of duplicating the same code. Like if uh, I can apply a correlation on a single channel of a two-way satellite time transfer, then multiplying to 14 channels is just a matter of, of having a loop and comparing the correlation peaks between the various channels. So this is really, the, the for, to me, the main benefit of, of uh, trying so many things. And then there's the scientific benefit of, uh, of, the st of as we mentioned, the long-term stability of the algorithm that will not drift over time and, and that will keep us uh, uh, the same result, uh, however long the integration time. So these are definitely, to me, the main benefits of software defined radio. I think that uh, after years, uh, that you are using this uh, approach, uh, you are uh, used to, to such uh, advantages because now they, they appear to you as normal. But uh, I, I guess that at the beginning you were very surprised by about the, 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 the power of this approach. Uh, have you an example, one of uh, your first uh, application where uh, these uh, advantages were uh, so uh, so striking uh, with respect to to the the way you you are you were used to to relate to time transfer to me the the obvious uh, when i was reading books about radar systems which is about timing echoes uh, they all appeared extremely complex in terms of hardware and in terms of, of signal processing and including how to run a correlator, an analog correlator, or how to run a mixer in an FMCW radar. And all these processing techniques that appeared hardly uh, accessible to someone who is not in a laboratory dedicated to these kinds of experiments could address this kind of, of, uh, of topics uh, without uh, this uh, dedicated hardware. Um, and, and I would say the same uh, for, for NMR experiments, uh, which relates more closely to uh, optical clocks. Uh, all these uh, signal processing techniques that involve radio frequency that would otherwise uh, necessitate complex uh, qualification hardware, uh, 
characterization uh, and with software defined radio, you send a signal and you know what it's going to be and you assemble bricks whose behavior you know, unlike most radio frequency circuits. And of course, the main challenge I met with respect to this benefit is getting familiar with the whole issue of, of discrete time signal processing, aliasing, uh, all these topics that are now familiar to us and are, uh, are uh, friends of ours uh, when we need them. At the first sight, they are really the challenge of, of uh, uh, propagating the right uh, sampling rate. These are all the challenges that we're meeting with, with uh, software different radio. Uh, you, you are a pioneer of uh, software defined radio. Uh, that means that you understood uh, its potential well before than other people. How did it change the, the way that people uh, uh, face to SDR during the, the years? Have you seen a difference uh, when, uh, uh, from the beginning, where uh, software defined radio was uh, not yet fully understood by, by people, and now that uh, a lot of people is using software defined radio? The software framework has changed a lot. Um, a lot of, of course, in the, the, the earlier you start, the more you have to write by yourself. And um, now we have ready-made framework, which on the one hand makes introduction easier. On the other hand, means that you have more black boxes to open to understand under the hood what's happening. Um, I, I still have a feeling that uh, most analog electronics uh, developers are reluctant to drive a shift towards uh, software defined radio. We see this with uh, every year we have this uh, uh, electronics engineer school from the National Research Center that is assembling and, and you really see that there is a, a dramatic uh, reluctance to shift to, to digital, uh, especially from an older community which is used to analog. Uh, and on the other hand, the software defined radio does not make signal processing easier. It makes it more fun, but it doesn't make uh, discrete time signal processing easier. And uh, this means that for a younger audience with uh, less mathematics inclination, uh, there is some reluctance to get started. And this is uh, especially seen, uh, um, for example, with ham radio where Software Defined Radio Academy is trying to attract uh, attention to, uh, to Software Defined Radio for the ham radio community, especially in Germany. And still there is a very strong reluctance from a lot of the community to, to shift to the digital world. And maybe one of the reasons is all these previous modes, all these unwanted aliases that we get. So of course, the signal is not clean when we emit and we have to be very careful on the analog side to, to remove all these unwanted signals. But of course, the challenge uh, of the mathematical representation of these uh, digital signal processing uh, makes, I think, uh, a barrier that software different radio is not removing, making it easier to jump, but not removing, and hence the, the challenge that people are moving. Um, but of course, the, the software is getting easier, gaining access to this uh, hardware is, is dropping. I mean, the software, the, the RTL SDR dongles that we've shown here make the, extend the community considerably now that now that the entry price is, is 10 euro uh, anyone with a bit of curiosity about the topic can get started uh, without having to to get the investment of a few hundred or a few thousand euro to get started so that that dramatically lowers the, the entry barrier towards software defined radio in general and, and digital discrete time digital signal processing of radio frequency signals in general so in this uh, regard, it, is, uh, it, it appears that it is easier for uh, uh, people that uh, um, for people that don't have uh, any experience in this field to, to access to software defined radio with respect to people that is experienced in the analog approach, or or not. Because it is indeed my belief that now it's just a matter of curiosity and interest as opposed to a, a large uh, financial investment. Uh, we, have a, I mean, computers have become ubiquitous. Uh, a Raspberry Pi and the RTL SDR total investment is in the 45, 50 euro range uh, to get started. Uh, and, and, and now it's mostly a matter of intellectual challenge of, of uh, wanting to discover new uh, signals and areas to, to I mean, 
also radio frequency signals have become ubiquitous around us. So as long as we, as long as we still have analog uh, radio, uh, FM, uh, the entry is, is very easy to get familiar with. Uh, when we shift to digital radio, it's going to be a bit harder to get started. But uh, I believe now that with all these signals that we have around us from satellites, from ground-based emitters, from radars, from uh, yes, the, the entry uh, step has much lowered uh, financially and intellectually to get started and so much fun that once you're hooked, uh, you will continue uh, discovering new areas and new signal processing techniques that are opened by all these uh, uh, radio frequency waves that you can, that you can listen at. Uh, Jan, uh, do you have any question for uh, Jean-Michel? Uh, yes, actually. So, I, um, in my experience, one of the main drawback of SDR compared to uh, full uh, full metal implementation in uh, in the FPGA is that generally in all the SDR framework there is a significant lag time when between the between an event and what you can send on the emission port uh, which can be several milliseconds or several tens of hundreds of milliseconds if you don't do things very well so i wanted to have your opinion and your experience on this point because i i find that there is significant challenges uh, in reducing these lag times and I want to know if you have worked on that as well and how you see this, this in the future. Yes, thank you, Jan. Uh, of course, we, we discussed a little bit this issue of, of bandwidth, of, of feedback loop, uh, time constant. Um, and, and actually, it was kind of a surprise to me when we had these uh, investigations that the, the conclusion that despite very fast digital electronics, um, the main benefit of uh, software defined radio or, or digital uh, processing in general would be on the long term stability as opposed to the fast uh, loop bandwidth. That was kind of a, a surprise that I had not expected initially when we started working on this. Uh, definitely keeping all processing in the FPGA will shorten uh, the, 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 the loop delay and hence the, the feedback uh, bandwidth. In all the presentation I gave in this, in this tutorial, I was addressing like open loop processing. For example, in, in a two-way satellite time transfer, I would uh, save five minutes worth of data and then I would spend like an hour processing these correlations to find uh, the time delay between the, the, the various uh, transmitted signals. The, the topics I addressed uh, hardly uh, mentioned uh, feedback closed loop systems. And you're absolutely correct that whenever we're doing uh, time stamping, the assumption is that the A to D converter, that's the example I was giving with the one PPS generation, the only time that we're familiar and that we know is when the A to D converter has sampled the data. After this, everything is going to be asynchronous. And definitely the fact that we accumulate packets that will be sent over networks, whether USB, Ethernet, that they will process by a multipurpose CPU that will be sent back, will add uh, ex extensive delay with respect to having the full processing in the FPGA. So I fully agree that for closed loop systems, software defined radio frameworks might not be appropriate. And this is the reason why in Besançon we developed this uh, uh, oscillator instability platform or scheme digital framework that tries to uh, lower the entry step into keeping the whole processing chain inside the FPGA and only using the processing system, the external CPU for configuration for uh, collecting data for user interaction and all closed loop systems uh, say in the FPGA so actually we're just completing right now an investigation on the maximum bandwidth that can be achieved by reducing the length of the finite impulse response filter by the PI controller so we're actually just uh, completing an analysis of how extensive the bandwidth could be in a very simple PI controller uh, not aimed at being complex but at actually being as fast as possible and typically we will reach uh, the megahertz bandwidth range, we believe, on 125 megahertz clocked FPGA. On, on FPGA, not in SDR? Fully FPGA in this Fully case. Okay. Definitely, I agree with you. Okay. And, and, and that is typically on a red pitaya or something like that, or do you need some special... Uh... Yes. This is the red pitaya where we, where we will 
I, I believe that now that we have these uh, uh, heterogeneous processing power where we mix uh, FPGA, uh, general purpose CPU, possibly GPU, it will be difficult to come back to the time where we had solely FPGAs uh, and the, the, the getting the best of the both worlds is, is really uh, efficient in terms of, of uh, lowering the challenge of, of uh, interaction with a user, uh, writing a UART or writing all these FPGA interactions are, are, is not well suited. And on the other hand, this, uh, this uh, heterogeneous architecture is, is really, I mean, uh, perfectly suited to this kind of task. So. So, so since we are a bit drifting on, on the subject of uh, FPGA uh, stuff, which is probably okay, um, that's kind of related, uh, I'm wondering if you have had some experience and some opinions about uh, the very expensive and new technologies in FPGA, like Ultra Scale Plus and stuff like that. Do you think that this, uh, well, this obviously brings a lot of uh, new computing power in the system? But in terms of uh, capability for low lag time or stuff like that, do you think it's going to be, going to have any any improvement with these uh, systems? I should first start answering that I am an example that we can address software defined radio with having no clue about FPGA since I have absolutely no idea how to program an FPGA and nowadays either you have a colleague that knows FPGAs or you have some of the higher level languages that will help you but I have absolutely no clue how to operate these uh, beasts uh, and um, since I am very much attracted towards uh, disseminating this uh, philosophy of digital signal processing, I always try to focus on the lower end hardware that is most accessible to the public. So I cannot answer because we do not have experience with this very high grade, uh, high level uh, uh, novel RF SOC or uh, radio frequency grade uh, zinc that are coming out at the moment. So we have not tested these devices. So I, I, I can hardly comment on this. Maybe Claudio, you have a, an answer to yes, that. Yes, uh, yeah, yeah. The, the you you spoke about a, a point uh, that is really interesting because uh, uh, the philosophy behind the software-defined radio is software, while an important layer is the FPGA that is uh, more likely uh, hardware. So there was a, a huge amount of work in trying to to match these two uh, quite different worlds. And, uh, and the results are, uh, are, uh, are very good. So um, do you think there is uh, still uh, uh, space for uh, improve this uh, these aspect in, in order to, to fit the software defined radio and use uh, better uh, FPGA? There is uh, any, any attempt in this regard uh, to work even better? I would say actually everything has to be done because now uh, we have uh, extensive software framework for uh, general purpose processing systems. Uh, high level synthesis languages uh, introduce ex uh, excessive lag and, and are not uh, pipelined uh, processing. So that will not uh, allow us to run. Uh, they are very nice for coprocessor, but not for uh, pipeline the radio frequency signal processing. And so at the moment, we're still stuck at the time where these very low level languages are at the same level of abstraction than the time when people were programming microcontroller at the assembly level, where, uh, of course, you're super efficient, you know, uh, cycle by cycle what's happening. But as soon as you want to do something even remotely complex, you get lost in thousands of lines of codes. Uh, now, my colleague, uh, Gwen Goavec, is investigating some of these higher level languages and, and is discovering that uh, uh, as opposed to a high level synthesis HLS where you have buffers and, and, and all these additional delays, uh, these converters, these descript harder description with higher abstraction languages, but high efficiency of description uh, will uh, provide the best of both worlds. Uh, on the one hand, uh, uh, pipelines, uh, real time, uh, real time. Uh, uh, continuous processing and on the other hand, a higher level abstraction layer. Um, so this is, for example, uh, the, the, the principle that is used in, in the Arctic uh, system. Uh, and, and this is definitely the way I would like to explore uh, 
to try to avoid uh, this uh, this very low level description of PGA, which I do not master, and and and, and again, uh, I, I will not be able to comment on, on this on this part of the of the, of the development. Uh, another aspect that I should emphasize is also the RFNOC framework from Etus Research, which is a bit different because they have this uh, bus bar uh, that tries to uh, stream data be between various blocks, but it's still a different beast because in, in RFNOC, you have to instantiate all the blocks that you expect to be using inside your FPGA. And once you've got this toolbox of, of processing blocks, then you can route your data from one processing block to another, which is different from uh, live synthesis of your flowchart to create a new bitstream that you will send into the FPGA. Okay, so it's like a, a, a microprocessor, a dedicated microprocessor where uh, the, the configuration is uh, fixed and you can reroute uh, everything inside to according to your needs. That's, uh, yes, right. because- Right, which also means that possibly your, yeah. Yeah, because the reconfiguring the FPGA is, uh, requires, uh, in an, an optimized way, it requires a lot of efforts. So this is a good trade-off in order to have something that is consolidated and uh, still flexible uh, that can afford a lot of uh, uh, application. Uh, if you want, uh, uh, you can uh, add uh, some words about educational and training. That was uh, one of the, the topic you, you touched in the end of your, uh, of your uh, tutorial. I, I think... Uh... Just to give an example, to, to me, um, signal processing is a very dry and annoying field if you're just learning in books. And on the other hand, you discover that once you master it, it is so much fun because it allows you to understand from uh, radar to analog uh, uh, FM to digital TV to, I mean, most communication nowadays relies at some point on, on digital signal processing. And software different radio makes this link between the abstract dry topic of applied mathematics in discrete time signal processing and the fun of applying this to, to, to real world uh, signals. And again, as I mentioned earlier, with this lower entry point of the RTLSDR, the, uh, now, now we work mostly on, on Raspberry Pi, uh, Raspberry Pi 4 with its quad core. Actually, the quad core of the Raspberry Pi 4 is more powerful than my laptop. So um, uh, the, 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 the computational cost is becoming uh, mostly free uh, in terms of, of, of money investment. And um, so, yes, I, I think that from a training purpose, uh, this, this, uh, this, this approach will allow to attract new participants, I would not say students because students are a bit more difficult to involve in, in, in the higher uh, mathematics that are involved. Um, so so the, this, this training uh, aspect is, has been well recognized by analog device. Analog device, uh, uh, Travis Collins and his colleagues, uh, Robin Getz and others, uh, have uh, launched the Pluto SDR. Uh, of course, it's obvious it's, it's a demo board of the analog devices chip, so it, it, it makes sense that they, uh, they want to, to promote their demo board, but instead of selling this several hundreds of euro as they would do for most analog device motherboard, it started at 80 euro, now it's starting slightly more expensive. They've written an amazing book uh, with all everything you can do with a Pluto SDR. And I think analog device understands very well that if nothing is done to train a new generation of digital uh, electronic engineers, uh, you'll end up having people playing on their smartphone, writing apps, but no one understanding the underlying digital signal processing anymore. And, and, and this is mandatory if we want to keep on developing uh, not only the economical impact of, of uh, radio frequency communication, uh, but but in general, the, the understanding of, of discrete mathematics, and it's not uh, the, the new topics of deep learning or, or these uh, artificial intelligence that is going to remove any of the underlying requirement of, of understanding discrete time uh, digital signal processing. Uh, Jan, do you have an additional question? Uh, another the... question and maybe a remark. Uh, so in your great presentation, you were uh, uh, mostly showing uh, your GNU radio uh, demonstrations. We were, were showing the use of uh, existing GNU radio implementation of blocks. And uh, I mean, you can already make quite a lot with that already. Uh, but I find that uh, you are uh, often uh, led to uh, write blocks of your own. 
uh, which which for which the the the, the learning curve is a little bit steep, uh, and I wanted to have a comment from you on if you think that uh, uh, it will become easier in the in, in the next future. It's very interesting because uh, you might have seen quite a lot of discussions uh, on on the new radio discussion mailing list, where quite early. Uh, most new radio users, including myself, will hurry to master uh, out of tree block writing. So as you mentioned, uh, custom block development. And um, the discussion on the one hand is that, as you just mentioned, uh, by cleverly assembling the few blocks already available and few means a, a few dozens, if not a hundred, you can actually already achieve most uh, processing results that you could expect. And what we were presenting at the European New Radio Day Days conference tutorials is an alternative to writing dedicated out of tree blocks, which require, as you mentioned, compliance with a framework of New Radio, which is a bit awkward sometimes, uh, is, is streaming the data to external tools. So basically, New Radio is extremely uh, well suited to uh, radio frequency baseband signal processing. And although there are some amazing demonstration, Bass and Brussels, uh, uh, Wi Fi implementation, Daniel Estevez, uh, GR satellite for uh, CCSDS decoding, I find it much easier to allow or uh, to let new radio process the baseband signal, uh, removing the, uh, the modulation, uh, extracting the bits, and then sending this information to external tools. I'm most familiar with Octave, so the free open source implementation of, of uh, MATLAB. Uh, and this streaming is very efficiently performed by using a UDP like 0MQ stream. And by doing this, I, I take the best of both worlds. I take new radio for processing baseband signal, which require high bandwidth, uh, rather simple processing, bandpass filter, frequency transposition, uh, uh, header detection, uh, this kind of, of stuff. And once we've uh, reached the higher level of, of abstraction, uh, I would stream this data to external tools which are more flexible, whether Python, whether uh, uh, Octave, rather than spending time writing it out of tree block, which, as you mentioned, is, is time consuming. I'm not sure there's going to be any um, facilitation in, in reaching the out of tree block development because new radio is a complex beast. The scheduler is not easy to understand. And I think as signal processing, it's not going to be easier to write the, the block itself. So streaming the data to external tools that make it more flexible is in my opinion, the easiest way to, to, uh, to process at the highest level of the data. And this, uh, the, the latter point, uh, um, is connected to what can be the last question because half an hour is uh, is uh, gone. Uh, what are the perspectives for uh, software defined radio that you can see? Uh, maybe about uh, new fields of uh, where it is used or uh, new functionalities that uh, can be implemented. Software defined radio is a tool. And like any tool, it can be used in so many ways. I tried at the beginning of the presentation to show the scientific fields where it was already used. Uh, of course, radio frequency communication, radar, NMR, whenever radio frequency signals are used. So I believe now that the extension would be, ext or the, 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 the future is going to be about um, extending frequency range, of course. Uh, MIMO systems seem to be very much the trend. So whether it's MIMO in terms of direction of arrival, but also uh, in our field uh, of, of uh, time and frequency, we wish to have uh, many inputs. I mean, your your uh, your setup, uh, Claudio, is a, is a best demonstration that the more input systems uh, you have, the more, the, or the more input and output, uh, the more data you can collect, the more data you have, the more fun you can have by comparing all these clocks. So I think massive MIMO with uh, more and more uh, 
coherent inputs, which is not the case in most of ATUS research hardware, uh, where you still have this PLL that is free running somewhere and that will introduce a random phase between channels. So I believe this, uh, this massive MIMO is going to really uh, add new applications. I would not say it would be a breakthrough in terms of fields of application, because already we have some MIMO that you can live with if you calibrate the phase offset between the channels. But I think this is going to really be uh, new fields to have fun with. Uh, in the future with software defined radio. Okay, uh, if you are, uh, if you Jan have other question, otherwise uh, we can conclude by thanking again uh, Jean Michel for this very, for this excellent uh, tutorial, and uh, I hope that uh, many people uh, will be able to to watch this as a, a real starting point uh, for software defined radio and also as uh, for uh, um, learning, uh, understand better how it works and uh, the philosophy that uh, is behind software defined radio. So I, I, actually, Cla Claudio, I, I do have an extra okay. funny question for, sure. for, for Jean-Michel. Uh, how do you actually make this pen moving around your screen for, <laughs> uh, for presenting things? I'm curious too. <laughs> This is the OBS. Uh, OBS has an option where if you have a green sheet, it will uh, interpret it as transparency and it will display the slides uh, as background image as long as you have a green sheet. And when you write on the green sheet, uh, it will display the text on top. And I find it a way to slow down and try to uh, present at a rate that is compatible with the audience uh, uh, a capability to acquire new information. So it's a way for me to make interaction between the digital world of software defined radio of a new radio companion and still sometimes trying to write on the board at a more human rate of uh, data acquisition. Thanks. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you again, Jean-Michel. And I think that this live uh, Q&A is uh, concluded. Thank you to everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you both. Have a good evening. Bye.